This is my first memory, and it feels wrong. I'm a child, harnessed to a bench in a van. I can't move. I don't want to. It's very dark. Vibrations hum through the chassis. The drone of tires on highway is hypnotic, lulling. I'm not happy. I'm not sad. I'm not afraid. I just am not. Siren sound, that irritating double whoop that usually means nothing and sometimes means everything. This time, it meant everything. The van lurches violently, throwing me against another child. No one made a sound. The van remained silent except for the collective sway of small bodies shifting and sliding within the harnesses. <coughs> Tires squeal. The world upends, but the harness keeps me in place. The van overturns and I black out. The memory ends here. It was in my mind, this fractured piece of my childhood, as I surfaced from a deep sleep. My toes were cold, and my left hand felt numb and oddly entangled. I tried to go back to sleep, but the sun burned overhead, glaring through my closed eyelids. My feet were getting colder by the second, and the ground, yes, the ground, I realized, the rocky, dirty, completely outside ground, hurt my back. I was way too old for this. I wiggled my fingers, a hand closed over them. Panic surged through me, inexplicable and primal. I gasped and sat up. Morning sunlight, a pale fairy tale gold, bore down on me. Thick California pines and dusty oak trees surrounded a perfectly concentric clearing. Slopes rose on all sides, forming a bowl. Everything looked unusually high. I shifted and realized I was in a long, shallow pit, a sort of runnel. I saw something flicker in the pines, a rich blue shadow blotting the scant light filtering through the trees. I thought about getting up to investigate, but something was wrong with my thought process, like I couldn't figure out the point of thinking a thought, let alone carrying it out. The figure resolved into a small, thin woman clad in a royal blue coat. Sunlight turned her bright blonde hair into white fire as she emerged from the trees. I watched her approach with a blank, unbothered mind. She stopped in front of me, staring down with unreadable gray eyes. Then she knelt. To my shock, she pressed her palms against my cheeks. They were cool and incredibly soft, like the hands of a very old person. Listen. Her whisper tickled my skin. I strained to accommodate her, to show what a very careful listener I was. All right, I said. Her eyelashes flicked against my cheek. I imagined her surveying the clearing with her wide eyes. Your husband killed my sister. I don't have a husband, I said. The blue-coated woman pulled away and shook her head fretfully. Her expression unsettled me, so I looked away. Her hands disappeared from my face. Heat rushed in to replace the coolness her skin left behind. Her shadow engulfed me, and I was suddenly gone. I looked up and saw only the clearing, trees and gold bracken coating the slopes, sunlight shafting through the branches. I stared into the shadows and thought I saw another flash of blue, Something inside me cracked, that dam of emotionlessness giving way under the force of... What? Horror? Sorrow? I tried to stand, but that hand, the stranger's hand, the one that had woken me in the first place, tightened over my own. Panic resurged as physical and as paralyzing as a blow. I looked down. Another girl, younger than me, and blessed with the sort of fine-featured androgyny that can get you anywhere, blinked awake. She looked at me, then at her hands, then back at me. She frowned briefly, then a smile split her face. Hi. A pair of bemused frown lines appeared. Do you know who I am? Not a girl. The voice was clear and sweet, but unmistakably male. Surprise and curiosity tempered my panic a bit. Um, no? He raised our entwined hands, matching bracelets dangled off them, clumsily woven with matching white beads that spelled out best friends, with little blue knots in between. Friendship bracelets, the kind you make in summer camp. I squinted against the sunlight, trying to focus on the boy. Man, actually. But my head felt thick and gray, like nothing. Unrendered, suffocating space. He sat up with a grimace and shook his head. Strands of sleek hair hit me in the face. Dust puffed up, making me sneeze. He apologized blearily, then extended his right hand. I shook it, bemused. Hello, best friend. I'm Richard. I blinked, feeling blank. Undefined panic clouded what little concentration I had. I realized he was still holding my hand. 
Both of our hands were clasped now, crossed in twin X shapes. He narrowed his eyes. Let me guess. I'm good at this. You're... Gabrielle. Rachel, I blurted. The name didn't sound right. In fact, it didn't sound like anything, but it felt right rolling off my tongue. My mind didn't remember, but my body did. He looked just as confused as me, if a little merrier. Together we looked around. It was a beautiful place, shades of gold and brown and pollen-dusted green, illuminated by truly ethereal morning sunlight. No people that I could see, no sound, but the runnel where we sat stretched the clearing and crisscrossed it, creating odd, inorganic geometry. Were you camping? Asked Richard. I shrugged. Footsteps crunched behind us, panic again, constrictive and overwhelming. I whirled around. A man bore down the slope, approaching quickly. There was an air of relief about him. Richard frowned, then smiled. He stood up, forcing me along with him. That's my boss. Suddenly, his face fell. He looked at me in moderate horror as the man slowed to a stop in front of us. Shit. Shit. Richard's boss echoed. That one word, brief and equivocal, betrayed some sort of liquid accent. Is that my boss, too? I asked. Maybe that's why I was so afraid. I'd screwed up badly at some kind of work function or outing. Though what it could be, I had no idea and had committed a fireable offense. Richard's boss looked at me with amusement. Your boss? I'm Rachel, I blurted, and extended my free hand. He grinned. He was older, fifty at least, probably more, but beautiful. I know. Richard's hand convulsed on mine. He thrust our wrists out, yanking me forward. We're best friends. Richard's boss fingered the bracelets. His wide, beautiful, merry smile made me blush. I'm very glad. Allow me to make the formal introductions. Rachel, this is Richard White. He's our new assistant. His eyes were positively luminous. Richard, this is my wife, Rachel. Richard dropped my hand immediately. I didn't... we didn't... Richard's boss laughed. I don't doubt, for one thing... You're the most innocent people I know. This comment, so offhand yet so assured, provided a hint of mooring in the vast, terrified nothing in which I floundered. Also, he gave us a once-over, and lingering on me with a grin that made me feel naked. You're both dressed. I looked down blankly and was relieved to see securely belted slacks, several unmolested layers of sweaters, and a jacket. I couldn't figure out why I was dressed as such on a warm day, but at least I had clothes on. I'm glad you met. I knew you'd hit it off, Richard's boss said. Richard wore a queasy smile. I realized I was watching him and looked away. Richard's boss, my husband, grinned and chuckled. You both look so guilty. Because I felt guilty. That pulse-pounding primal panic. An animal caught in a trap. Why? Richard's boss draped an arm around my shoulders. With it came a pleasantly suffocating blanket of calm. Tension melted, replaced with memory. Michael? Michael. My husband, Michael. He smiled. There she is. He squeezed my hand and exchanged pleasantries with Richard, who still looked pained and guilty. As they spoke, my mind drifted, grasping onto shards of memory and putting them together. I could practically see them, jagged blue pieces of glass, scraping and grinding as they struggled to fit together. Slowly the memories resolved, and I finally remembered something. I'd met my husband at work. I'd been a costume designer and seamstress for a theater company. Michael was a true blue patron of the arts. The night of my first show, he came backstage. He knew all my co-workers, and they all seemed to love him. It made me nervous. I was afraid he wouldn't like me, and that if he didn't like me, I'd be fired. Noticing my less-than-stellar reaction, Thomas, my program director, pulled me aside and said Michael almost single-handedly kept us going with donations in the tens of thousands of dollars. So... Be nice. Thomas's eyes bored into mine, cold as ice and hard as flint. He hated me. I knew it. So why had he hired me? Why did he keep me? He could have his pick of costume designers. It was LA, and I was dispensable. Thomas's gaze flicked to Michael, who was enthusiastically shaking hands with Carmela, the stage manager. Thomas smiled and looked back at me, his hands tightened on my shoulder, uncomfortably close to my throat. He told me to give him what he wants. Thomas steered me towards Michael, who was laughing uproariously. A blushing Carmela basked in his amusement, 
looking very pleased with herself. Thomas shoved me forward. Michael, still laughing, glanced at me, then Carmela, then back at me. He had strange eyes, one clear bottle blue, the other deep, vivid green. Ridiculous eyes. Young adult novel eyes. Inexplicable terror bolted through me, followed by excitement. He held my gaze for a few extra beats. Over his shoulder, Carmela shot me an unreadable look. Then he extended a hand, broad, long-fingered, uncomfortably strong. He smiled, opened his mouth, and looked down bashfully. Then he peered sideways, as if afraid to look at me head on. His eyes were so bright. Michael. God. Thomas hissed. I heard, even from a few feet away. I also heard Carmilla shushing him. No, Thomas. He said genuinely. Just Michael, but I'm very flattered. Thank you. I'm Rachel, I said. I've heard. He had a trace of an accent, something liquidly European. Thomas was excited to get you. Unable to contain my shock, I laughed. It made him laugh too. What? Feeling bold, I beckoned Michael close. He leaned in, inches from my mouth. He hates me, I whispered. I glanced over at Thomas, who was unapologetically staring at us. Between you and me, I think this is going to be my first and only show here. I wouldn't worry about that. Michael pulled back. He met Thomas's glare and winked. He's just prickly, trust me. You'll be best friends before you know it. His hand went to my elbow, shockingly possessive and familiar. He started to speak again, but Carmela frantically stormed through. It was showtime. Will I see you after? Michael asked. I'm not going anywhere after. I have to clean up after the performance. He smiled radiantly. I'll come back to help you. Before I could speak, he turned around and disappeared into the hubbub. True to his word, he stuck around after curtain call. Usually it was just me, Carmela, and Thomas, working for what felt like hours. Michael made the work twice as fast and fun. For me, anyway. Thomas remained distinctly icy the entire night. But for the first time since I'd been hired, I managed to ignore him. Michael made it easy. His attention was intoxicating, his energy infectious. At 54, he was exactly twice my age, but seemed so much younger. After we locked up, he invited us all for a late dinner. My treat. He smiled. It was nearly two in the morning, and surprisingly cold. Carmela shook her head blearily. Thomas rolled his eyes. Strange, that Mr. Give-him-what-he-wants was so openly disdainful. I've got other things to do, including sleep. Far be it from me to interrupt a man's sleep. Michael said genuinely. He leaned in toward me and whispered, A woman's, on the other hand. I shushed him frantically. Thomas gave us the coldest, tiredest look I'd ever seen. Have fun, you two. We did. So much, in fact, that I was late for work the next morning. Thomas was waiting for me. For once, he didn't look angry or mean. Just tired. We worked on sets in silence for what felt like hours. Tension clung like a suffocating fog. I couldn't stand it. It sent trickles of apprehension and panic through my bloodstream, coagulating into a terrible pressure in my chest. Finally, I steeled myself and said, What's wrong? Thomas rolled a newly dried background flat without meeting my eyes. He's a slut, you know. I could tell. I hesitated. Were you an item or anything? He rolled his eyes, but didn't look at me. No. Look, what to say and how... I won't cause any problems or bring any issues to work. I don't expect anything from him. Thomas resolutely kept his eyes on the flat. I don't even know if I like him. This was a lie. That's what everyone says. Everyone? Everyone. Thomas finally looked at me, cold and tired, an expression much too old for him. He's an original bluebird, Rachel. What does that mean, really? Don't be stupid. He snapped. He's perfect until he has what he wants. If his behavior last night was perfect, then perfect leaves a lot to be desired. I lied. My words issued in a high, uneven register. Why was I afraid? Why was I so afraid of everything? Thomas looked thoroughly unconvinced. Just don't say we didn't warn you. It was true I didn't expect anything from Michael, but he thwarted those expectations utterly. Every night he came back to help. Every night he was progressively more possessive. Every night we left together. Thomas didn't say another word about it. The last night of the show, I was ill. High fever, swimmy dizziness. The colors were too saturated. Outlines unreliable. 
as if any moment they'd break their bounds and morph into something else. Michael stayed after the show as always. He was colder than I expected, considerate and helpful, but uncharacteristically quiet. Made sense, really. He was wasting his time. I wasn't taking anyone home with me tonight. At some point while hanging costumes, I drifted off. I woke abruptly, an indeterminable amount of time later, to Thomas's voice. I can't do this. He was crying. I perked up, feeling dizzy and achy and utterly embarrassed. I'm not the one to take it up with, was Michael's clipped response. He is, Thomas sobbed. An unfamiliar voice heaved a great sigh. Thomas, whatever were you thinking? An old man, syllables dripping with a contemptuous regret that made my skin crawl. Or maybe it was the fever chills. I thought... Thomas wept. I thought... You delude yourself. Michael spat. You should have known. The old man agreed, and Thomas broke down into sobbing. Moved by concern, I tried to stand up, but the world swooned and the floor hit me. Rachel? Thomas's voice, shrill and hiccupy. Footsteps reverberated through the floorboards. I tried to get up, but blacked out instead. I surfaced from the memory with a sharp gasp. Sunlight and pine needles overwhelmed my senses, dragging me away from the past and back into the clearing with the fairy tale forest. Richard peered at me, shy and alarmed. Sorry, leg cramp, I lied. Michael guided me out of the runnel onto the stable ground and toward the slope. Richard trailed after us at a respectful distance. Where are we? I asked as we entered the trees. Cool shadows engulfed me. I thought of the blue-coated woman prowling the darkness, watching me, and shuddered. Michael looked at me sharply. Do you not remember? No, I confessed. He looked over his shoulder. Richard was still in the clearing, dragging his feet as he trudged forward. Michael leaned in. You haven't been doing well. You've been here to... to reset. Am I in rehab? He hesitated. No. Why is your assistant here? For the first time, he wouldn't look at me. It's homecoming day. He came to meet you. Why? I thought he might help you. With what? With days you aren't feeling well, he said evasively. I fell abruptly silent, turning the implications over in my mind, skittishly examining each. Do you think it's a good idea? I wouldn't have introduced you otherwise. But last night, what if it was drugs? What if he brought me drugs? It wasn't, and he didn't. But- Rachel, it was a bad reaction to a bad treatment. That's why we're leaving. More implications, more questions, more fears. Where's everyone else? I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. I saw a woman here. He was concentrating on picking his way over slippery leaves and rocks. What? When I first woke up, before you came, there was a woman. She came through here, through the trees. And? I opened my mouth, but a rumble of that now familiar panic, equal parts primal and ridiculous, choked me. I fumbled and finally said, I don't know. He moved behind me, cupped my elbows, and steered me toward a break in the trees ahead. Maybe a worker. Probably a dream. Though the blue-coated woman's words echoed in my head, I agreed with him. Michael was boisterous, loyal, and passionate, empathetic to a fault, and above all kind. He couldn't kill anyone. I was so stupid for being afraid. We broke through the trees. I blinked stupidly in the sudden brightness. Cabins were evenly spaced along the dirt meridian. A car, our car, was parked in front of the farthest one, next to a jewel-toned motorcycle. Michael strode forward and opened the door for me. I looked at it, nonplussed. Go on, he said breezily. You're all packed. Footsteps crunched behind me. Richard. What about... I waved uncertainly. Richard, that's his bike. He smiled, that dazzling trademark smile. What do you think about breakfast? The forest, it turned out, was an anomaly, a lone oasis of green in the middle of a seemingly vast desert. The ride into the city was long and awkward and slowed by rush hour traffic. Finally, Michael pulled into a tiny lot, paid for a spot, and parked. He led me into a posh cafe. I realized my palms were sweaty and wiped them on my pants. Richard entered right as Michael requested a table on the roof. Despite Michael's attempts at conversation, awkwardness reigned until our food arrived. So, he said as he cut his sausage, I don't know what you managed to discuss last night, but Richard, you might be interested to know that Rachel works as a coach and event organizer at the theater. 
Richard perked up. Do you act? I shuddered. Not anymore. Turns out I hate attention. The readiness of the memories troubled me. Richard gave a small, nervous grin. Then however did you end up here? Honestly, I don't remember anymore. Michael swallowed a bite of French toast. When Richard isn't answering my phone, he's a musician. A quite talented one. I smiled encouragingly. That smile froze as Richard visibly blanched. His eyes darted from side to side, forehead knit. He stood up suddenly, knocking into the table. I... I'm sorry. I, I need... He turned and dashed towards the bathroom. None of our fellow diners paid him any notice. Maybe we should stop eating, I said. No, don't tell him I told you. It's illegal after all, but he has severe stomach issues. I picked at my food, choosing my next words with care. I really don't know what happened last night. I'm sorry. He smiled reassuringly. I have more than a vague idea. Don't worry, it wasn't your fault. This didn't feel right. Nothing felt right. Richard didn't remember either. At first, he didn't even know his name. Michael looked up sharply. I'm sorry? He didn't know his name, or who I was, or who you were, at first. Michael took another bite. You told me you saw a woman this morning. To me, it sounded like a dream. I knew what he was getting at. Frustration reared its head. But you were there. Yes, and I heard him say, shit, that's my boss, which is understandable under the circumstances. I saw him drop your hand when he realized he was holding it. I took it as embarrassment, since you spent the night outside under his care. Where were you? Why did he come and not you? I was working. I arrived in the middle of the night and stayed in the guest house. They wouldn't let me wake you or see you. Had they done so, you wouldn't have been outside all night. More proof of the faculty's unsuitability. I couldn't meet his eyes. Oh. He wiped his mouth and crumpled the napkin. Excuse me, I'm in need. He said wryly. Of the facilities. I nodded. He reached across the table and caressed my cheek. It was unexpected, but delightful. I looked up. He had a sad smile. We'll go over everything, don't worry. I smiled back, unable to help myself. He got up and disappeared around the corner. I watched him, sad and scared, yet grateful for him. I returned to my empty plate, suddenly realizing how very long Richard had been gone. I looked out the window. His motorcycle was in clear view, right beside Michael's car. I was so focused on it, I barely noticed when he slid into the seat across from me. Slightly startled, I rearranged my face into a welcoming smile. I registered the bright yellow hair and vibrant blue coat before I realized it wasn't Richard. The woman's gray eyes were full of sorrow, but utterly dry. She was so loved, Rachel. You don't even know. I couldn't speak. She reached across the table and grabbed my hand gently, tenderly. I tried to pull away, but she tightened her grip. Nails, short and blunt and terribly hard, dug into my skin. Let go of me, I whispered. I jerked my hand, but each time she held more tightly. She's gone, but we know, she said. We're all still here. Let... My voice was so soft, so horribly soft. Let. And we're waiting. Let. Let me go! My scream rang through across the floor. She smirked, tightened her grip excruciatingly, then released my hands as Michael barreled upstairs. The blue coated woman's eyes went from him to me. The smile widened. I stood up, face burning as a dozen pair of eyes tracked me and dashed to the stairs. Michael caught me. Who is that? I lost all volume, voice reduced to an ill wheeze. Who, who is she? Who? What? I pointed accusingly at the table, but it was empty. The rooftop cafe was clean, bright square populated with 18 small tables arranged in a neat grid. There was nowhere to hide. I stood in front of the only exit. There was no way she could have gotten past me. I fought back tears as ugly, unwelcome puzzle pieces arranged themselves in my mind. So many were missing, but I had enough to understand what was happening. In some kind of inpatient facility for serious issues, they hadn't done what they were supposed to. I was suffering from some sort of amnesia. I was seeing things that didn't exist. Something was wrong with me. I couldn't remember what it was, but it was so bad Michael couldn't bring himself to say it on what was supposed to be a happy day, homecoming day. I started to cry. Michael wrapped his arms around me, soothing me with soft, indistinct murmurs and walked me down the stairs. 
It was dark outside, almost too dark, and I fought back shivers as he settled the bill, then he ushered me outside, back into the bright morning, and helped me into the car. Humiliated, I stared into my lap, watching my fingers writhe helplessly. Then I saw small, viciously deep crescents in my skin, bruisy, oozing blood, rising into welts, the kind of marks left by fingernails. I held my hand up as Michael entered the car. He looked over, brow furrowed, and gently took my hand. What happened here? You're bleeding. It took all of my strength to keep my voice steady. I don't know. He watched me carefully, eyes seeming to bore into my skull. Maybe my voice wasn't as steady as I'd thought. Then he smiled and reached over, hand sliding under my hair and cupping the back of my head. It was intimate, romantic, and incredibly soothing. I leaned in. We'll get you sorted. He put the car in gear. Only when we reached the corner did I realize Richard's motorcycle still sat in the lot, gleaming in the sun. I looked down at my hands, at the nail marks. This all happened yesterday. None of it, and nothing that's happened today, makes sense to me. Please help me if you can, because I don't know what to do. I still don't know what's going on. Everything's gotten worse, but I think I'm on the verge of understanding things. Ever since waking up in the woods, my memory is nearly eidetic, especially when it comes to conversations. Maybe because there's so much empty space in my mind now, maybe because effectively having no memories is so terrifying I'm overcompensating on a subconscious level. In any case, I've been able to recall everything. So here it is. When Michael and I got home from breakfast, I took a shower. As I undressed, I noticed I was wounded. Half-healed cuts slashed the tops of my feet and wound up to my thighs in neat clinical lines. I also had twin wounds at the joints, where bicep met forearm. They were bruisy and welted. The swelling and discoloration made me look dead below the waist. I tried to remember what happened, but of course, no luck. It was hideous and frightening, and looking at it made me cry. After dithering, I called Michael in. Maybe it was my paranoia, but he didn't look half as shocked as I had expected. Which makes sense. He knows a lot more about what happened at the facility than I do, right? Let's go see the doctor. We need to sue the facility, and we need records to do it. I finished my shower, choking back tears the entire time. Then we went to the doctor. The office was empty, efficient, and unfamiliar. The doctor knew me, though. She swabbed the cuts with disinfectant and prescribed me antibiotics without batting an eye. What do you think happened? I asked. She shrugged, dispassionate and calm. I don't know, Miss Altair, but we'll find out, won't we? Michael and I went home after that. While I wandered around, trying to reacquaint myself with my life, he got called into work for an emergency. No leeway, no way to beg off. He promised to be home by eight and left, just like that. Without him, I felt alone and inexplicably afraid, so I decided to take a nap. I had a dream. I think it might be another memory, or close to one. In the dream, I was tiny, maybe five or six. I huddled in a dim, warm room crowded with crying children. Adults in elaborate masks stood in every corner. Occasionally, they laughed and whispered among themselves, sibilants making my skin prickle. The other children wept and wailed around me. Tears streamed down my face, but I refused to make a sound. Something dreadful was coming, a horrific trap closing around me as I sat helplessly. I was going to die. Part of me knew how, but my mind flitted around the edges of it, shying away from knowledge too horrific for anyone, let alone a kindergartner. My breath hitched. To hide it, I looked around, surveying my sniveling companions with false imperiousness. The boy next to me met my gaze defiantly. His eyes were tearless and cold. Jealousy overwhelmed me, along with the terrible realization. He's going to win, I thought. They will choose him. He stared back at me. He had light eyes, a rich caramel gold that nearly glowed in the dim. His mouth twitched, but then he turned away. His imperiousness looked much more genuine than my own, and he looked ahead. Suddenly, a great pair of doors opened. Light cascaded into the room, the light of rich royal gold that spills from the windows of castles. The masked people strode into the center of the room, then filed out. I stood up to follow, so did the boy beside me, as well as a few other children. Most, however, sat sniveling on the floor. As we crossed the threshold, a last masked man swept through the room, barking orders and forcing the snivelers to their feet. 
I squinted my eyes, less against the light and more against the sheer opulence of the room. Reds, violets, ultramarines, and emeralds, all bathed in a stunning golden glow. The masked people led us down a long blue carpet toward a recessed, tiled pit. Long golden tables lined the carpet. Masked adults in stunning finery sat at the tables, clapping as we passed. I sniffed eagerly, hoping to catch a last whiff of something delicious, but to no avail. Except for dishes, the tables were empty, not a crumb of food to be seen. Bitterly disappointed, I faced forward again and marched into the pit. As I descended, the opulence dimmed. The pit was disgusting, caked in dark grime and streaked with tacky filth. My bare feet squelched as I stepped in a drying puddle of filth. I looked around and bit back another sob. The walls were sheer, the only exit guarded by impossibly tall adults. There was no way out. The inn was near, and it was as filthy and dark as the pit. This arena. A dozen more masked men entered the pit, neatly arranging themselves along the perimeter. One sidled just behind me. I wanted to move away, but I didn't dare let him see my fear. Somehow I knew that he was, in fact, male. Not every masked adult was, but most of them were. A voice suddenly boomed from overhead, ringing down into the pit like the voice of God. My children, children, you're all so special. We love you all. A few relieved sobs broke like a breathless choir. Each of you will fulfill that love. The voice echoed through the pit, making my head ring. I closed my eyes. It was deafening, but somehow, somehow, through the din of weeping children and booming God voice, I heard a whisper. I whirled around. It was the man in the mask. It was a wolf, an ornate thing crafted from glass. I saw my dirty face reflected back at me, all tangled hair and haunted eyes. In the dream, they were a mad swirl of green and gray and copper. But if you listen to me, you might live. Through the curved eye holes, flashes of color gleamed. A very few of you, shrieked the voice, will fulfill that love over time. Most will fulfill it tonight. Whatever you do. The man whispered. The winners will be happiest. God shrieked. But we cannot have winners without losers. Who wants to win? The cries rose around me in a deafening flood, horror and jubilation in equal measure, rising like a flock of birds. Then here, my beloveds, here is how you win. Don't scream. The masked man hissed. We love to hear screams. Predictably, a cacophony of screams drowned me. I wanted to scream too, not even for fear, but from pain. I scanned the crowd of shrieking children, looking feverishly around and wondering if I'd been tricked. Through the mass, I saw a pair of familiar caramel eyes. The boy. He wasn't screaming either. He watched me, eyes wide and lips twisted into a confused snarl. I looked distrustfully at the masked man. Deep in the shadows of the wolf's face, I caught glimmers of his mismatched eyes. One blue, one green. Without a second thought, I whirled around and raked my fingernails down the face of the girl next to me. Suddenly, the shrieking and weeping around me dulled. My heartbeat thundered in my ears as I tore through the throng, kicking and punching and tearing out locks of hair with such force that the roots came out bloody. On my periphery, I saw the caramel-eyed boy agape. As I was driving my thumbs into the eyes of a toddler, he shook himself and rounded it on his neighbor. I looked up and saw a stunning rotunda depicting a hexagon of beautiful landscapes. I did not belong up there, with beauty. Going up to a beautiful place was what happened when you died. Something on the side of the pit caught my eye. I focused. It was a person. Peering over the rim of the pit was a blonde lady with gray eyes and a blue coat fit for royalty. Her mouth moved. I couldn't hear her, but I could read her lips as easily as a book. I will protect you. I woke with a start, not immediately knowing where I was. My face stung and my ears were wet. I sat up, frantically scraping my skin, but it was simply tears. I cried so much they'd soaked the hair up my temples and dripped into my ears. I looked at the clock, 7.41, and it all came back to me. What little I remember, that is. I got out of bed with a shudder and dressed myself. Michael didn't get home until 9.30. He was almost absurdly apologetic. To make it up to me, he took me out to what was probably the fanciest restaurant I could have imagined. The place was modern and beautiful and dimly lit full of greenery and populated exclusively by couples. I looked around anxiously, expecting the woman in the blue coat to appear any moment. The greeter, Maitre D, smiled with differential recognition when he saw me. 
He wasn't the only one. As he led us to our table, a handful of men nodded in acknowledgement as we passed. As Michael made small talk, I sneaked furtive looks at several couples. Each pair had an uncomfortable commonality, an old man with a subsequently younger partner. I was easily the oldest woman present, except for a scant scattering of seemingly barely legal boys. Michael was the youngest man. In spite of this, I found it surprisingly easy to loosen up in a place that served meals roughly the cost of a car payment. Not that I knew what my car payment was, or if I had my own car at all. By the time the attendant had delivered our drinks, high-end alcohol for Michael and hot tea for me, I was more at ease than I'd been all day. Michael even managed to coax a great deal of laughter out of me. I felt relaxed and safe with him, ever more so when I realized that the woman in the blue coat didn't seem to materialize when Michael was with me. That made it pretty clear to me that she was a delusion. Convincing, yes, and frightening, but ultimately a boogeyman. Maybe the kind only psychological frailty can conjure, but a boogeyman nonetheless. Not that I was entirely happy with Michael. He wouldn't discuss the facility or my illness. He said, let's have a good night and worry about everything in the morning, even though those were the only things I really wanted to talk about. He wouldn't play along though, so instead I accomplished a total inversion of the common first date by asking my husband to tell me about myself. What do I do for a living? You're an undercompensated creative, literally the best in the world in your field. When we met, I fully intended to get you work with prestigious people in exotic places overseas, but I fell in love with you instead. How? Quick and early. How long have we been married? Five years in May. How long have we been together? From what point? I looked at him, suddenly unsure. He gave me a wicked little smile, fingers traveling absently over his glass. I felt like he was testing me. But how and why? Uh, first night together? First date? What came first? The smile morphed into solemn intent. Can you tell me? I shook my head. He smiled guiltily. We never really had a first date. We had our first night and that was more or less that. I waited, painfully aware that one of the pretty young things behind me had begun to cry. I resolved to ignore it and secretly cursed the bastard who broke his naive toy's heart over a decadent meal in a public place full of rich people. Michael took pity on me and said, We met at the theater four years and two months ago. So, we were together for five months before we got married? Were we? I rolled my eyes and bit back a smile. Stop it. Shit. I covered my mouth instantly, glancing around to see if anyone had heard. Not that I ought to have worried. The girl behind me was whining loudly. Let me ask her, she moaned. Please, j just to see. So I assume, I said smoothly, under the circumstances that the theater gave me a nice long chunk of leave. Don't get any ideas. It's nowhere near over. Well, all right then. As the girl's irritating whining became louder and more desperate, I looked at my husband and wondered what topics of conversation I was allowed to broach. Work seemed safe so far. Work made me think of Thomas, my boss at the theater. I could see him in my mind's eye, rangy, with striking caramel eyes that did little to offset his perpetual contempt for everyone around him. The memory of him made me think of my dream. I fought off a shiver. Mental illness nightmares really are awful. So, I have a question. Michael's eyes shifted quickly. Tension, exposed for a second, receded as he put on a warm, quizzical smile. It is? Thomas and I, did we ever actually become best friends, like you said? Thomas. He repeated carefully. The girl at the next table screamed. My heart dropped to my feet. Uh, he's my boss. The night we met, he was being an utter jackass, and you told me not to worry, that he'd be my friend before I knew it. Michael had blanched. No trace of his usual smile remained. How did we meet? Relieved that I knew at least this story, I related the story quickly. He got paler as I went on, but he didn't look upset. Relieved that I knew at least this story, I related the story quickly. He got paler as I went on, but he didn't look upset exactly. Disbelieving, yes, but not unhappy. I expected encouraging words, maybe even for him to take my hand or brush his thumb across my cheek. What he said was, That isn't how we met. Behind us, the girl screeched, and by the sound of it, she flipped a table over. 
A massive commotion ensued. Michael's eyes went wide. He shot to his feet, motioning frantically for someone to come. When I felt hands, long, soft, supplicating hands needing my sleeves, I knew why. I looked down. The girl had crawled to me. She knelt awkwardly, crumpling her long limbs so her head didn't rise above my knees. Trails of mascara and eye makeup streaked her face, cutting trails through perfect foundation. She looked so young. A baby, made up in her mother's expensive clothes. Please, she whispered, and rubbed her cheek against my skirt. Her narrow shoulders shook. Please stop them. I... My throat was inexplicably dry. I could barely speak. It took a Herculean effort to even whisper. I don't know what you mean. She keened miserably. Tears gushed from her eyes. I didn't do anything wrong. I only did what you showed me. That's enough. Michael's tone was alien in its shocking coldness. The girl ignored him. She only had eyes for me, apparently. Don't let her take me. It isn't fair. I never screamed, remember? I never screamed. She broke down into wordless mumbling, face buried in my lap. Reflexively, I stroked her hair. Stop that. Michael grabbed me roughly and forced me to my feet. As soon as I broke contact, the girl began to scream. Two men, not the elegant elderly diners, but young men, hard men, hauled her to her feet. She struggled and screamed as she was dragged across the floor towards a discreet door. Don't let them take me! You promised! Please! The door shut abruptly, cutting her off. Michael started after, white-faced and furious. When he turned to me, I flinched, but the fury melted into a thin smile. That was unfortunate. He took a deep breath, surveying the room. Shall we go? I guess so. It was louder than I intended. Bizarrely, a flurry of well-mannered titters followed my pronunciation. It was the old men. The men were laughing, as if I told a sly joke. Michael gave a tight smile, nodded to the host, and made a swift exit. We got to the car. He opened the door for me like a gentleman and climbed into the driver's seat with a smile. I waited for him to start the car, but he didn't. What happened? I said. How would I know? It looked like an unstable woman. They're everywhere, if you haven't noticed. This stung so badly, more than I'd have ever guessed. His hands were trembling. He noticed me noticing and drummed them along the steering wheel to hide it. You shouldn't have touched her. She was the one touching me. My voice broke. To my horror, tears pricked my eyes. Without answering, Michael put the car into gear and drove home. I was going to end the update here, but I can't. After that, we went home and were in bed by midnight. We didn't speak a word. I didn't quite dare, and he wasn't forthcoming. I slept briefly, but deeply, only mildly haunted by screaming girls and snarling boys with tawny eyes. Those eyes followed me as I surfaced from sleep. Within a minute, I was wide awake, with no hope of going back to sleep. I got out of bed and glanced at the clock, 2.30 a.m. Without moving, I counted silently to 60. Michael didn't move except for the steady rise and fall of his chest. I moved to the door on tiptoes, thankful the expensive wooden floor didn't creak, and crept downstairs. Afraid to make any noise, I wandered aimlessly through the lower level. Clean dining room, gleaning bathrooms, pristine living room, and austere guest rooms. For want of anything better to do, I tried the handle on the door to his home office, even though I knew it was locked. Even the kitchen was gloriously neat, not a speck or splatter or a single dish in the sink. I ended my exploration more awake than ever. Feeling defeated, I lowered myself to a seashell-colored sofa I only vaguely recognized. It faced a large bay window. Ambient light bled along the edges of the dark curtains. I focused them, struggling to pick out folds and wrinkles in the dark. There weren't many. The curtains were as immaculate as the rest of the house. With a sigh, I scanned the room, gaze alighting on the coffee table. Among the tasteful arrays of glossy hardcovers was an odd shadow. I reached over, fingers closing on something cool and hard. I brought it close to my face, squinting in the dark. It was a necklace, a pendant molded into the shape of a bull's head, with rubies for eyes. I inspected it closely, marveling at both the craftsmanship and sheer oddity of the thing. After a while, I set it back on the table, feeling tired. I rubbed my eyes and looked over to the window again. The light spilling from the curtains was the unmistakable orange of sunrise. Disbelieving, I went to the window and pulled the panels back. Sure enough, it was morning. A beautiful one, sky streaked with white gold and deep orange and pink clouds. 
I thought about waking Michael, but I didn't want to talk to him. I was finally starting to feel afraid of him. Feeling defeated, I went to the kitchen. Coffee, cereal, toast, orange juice, it didn't matter. Just something to occupy me, to keep my hands busy while my mind whirled. While I went through the cabinets, looking for a bowl and spoon, I noticed that the coffee pot was half full. Frowning, I held my hand by the carafe. Heat radiated from it. Fresh coffee? Chills ran down my spine. I looked away and saw the sink. Two bowls, two spoons, two forks, two coffee cups. All were neatly rinsed and stacked. Traces of soft oatmeal clung to one bowl. This wasn't right. It was clean when I'd woken last night. Perfectly clean. Unnaturally clean. Sink empty. Coffee machine spotless and cold. Suddenly nauseous, I spun around and ran upstairs to my bedroom. The door hung partially open. I bust in and froze. Empty. Bed inexpertly made. Fan off. Curtains thrown back to welcome the morning. Michael was gone. The beside clock read 7.36. I'd lost five hours, and in the interim, my husband had woken, dressed, eaten breakfast with me, and gone off to work. I'd remembered none of it. Which, obvious aside, was a serious pity because I had no idea what, if anything, he told me. I staggered downstairs and collapsed in the couch. I couldn't concentrate. Tears pricked my eyes. I was so focused on blinking them away, on keeping my shaking hands still, that it took me a long time to notice that the bull's head was gone. In its place, resting neatly on the nearest coffee table book, was a manila envelope. Scrawled along the front were four words. You can't tell them. I stared at the envelope for what felt like forever. Then, almost without being aware of it, I struck forward and snatched the envelope. It was light and thin. It couldn't possibly hold much. I fumbled the tab and slid the contents onto my lap. They were photos. The first was of me, but as a child. I couldn't have been more than seven. Long, wavy hair framed my expressionless face. Wide eyes stared blankly into the camera, a severe olivine green. It might have been a beautiful picture were I not so disturbingly blank. I frowned. The picture was wrong, doctored. My eyes weren't green, they were blue, flat gray blue, about as dull as blue eyes can be. Oddly enough, my irises in the photo were raised, bumpy. I flipped the photo around curiously and saw why. Someone had scribbled all over it until it was almost completely black. Through the jags and whirls, I saw the letters R and E, and possibly I farther down the page, but it was impossible to discern with any certainty under the ragged layers of ink. I flipped it back over and stared into child me's wrong eyes. I wore a black, long-sleeved dress and a necklace. The bull's head pendant, in fact, the dark dress nearly camouflaged it, but the ruby eyes gave it away. I set it on the sofa and shook out the next picture. It was much more interesting. It was a photo of Michael, staring into the camera with no more expression than the child me. It was almost inhuman, this lack of anything, like a breathing mannequin. He was younger, too, at a glance, no more than 25. That didn't mean anything, though. He didn't even look his age now. Though this portrait was black and white, I imagined I could see the distinct shades of his eyes and the deep auburn of his hair, so dark it was almost black except in sunlight. I turned the photo over. Unsurprisingly, it was also defiled with the wildly cross-hatched ink, but in marker this time. I caught the loops of a single letter near the top. B. I put it in on top of my child portrait and turned to the last photo. It was the most interesting of all. It was her. The woman in the blue coat stood with Michael, standing in a bright, small room, crowded with dresses and paint and flats and suits and repurposed bits of carpentry. He draped his arm around her shoulders and wore a small, satisfied smile, almost a smirk. Her grin was so wide, her lips thinned to nothing around her white teeth. She wore a necklace, silver or maybe white gold, littered with tiny blue stones. I knew where they were, even now I know it better than I know anything else. It was the theater, backstage at my theater. Two people stood in the background. The first was a stout, stooped man. He stood in such a way that I could only see a sliver of his face. Not much, but enough to tell that he was elderly. Behind him, tall and slender and facing the camera, was Thomas. I couldn't look away from him. He wore that expression I knew so well, that familiar mask of almost impersonal contempt. The lights overhead threw his face into sharp relief and lit his eyes. Even from a distance I could discern the color, 
clear golden brown. I thought again of my nightmare, of the imperious boy and his snarl as he tore a violent swath through a sea of helpless, terrified children. It couldn't be. That part, it makes no sense and I know it. I do, but Michael, Michael and the blonde woman, oh, it makes sense. Or at least it will, very soon. I turned the photo over. Unlike the others, it bore a nonsensical jumble in at least two distinct handwritings. Capacity Kitten, she was a safe place. Don't, are you there? Silver Sapphire, Emerald Towers, stop. Watch Eyes Rose, Owl Kite Timber Mirror Dove, stop. Blue Finn, I'm here. Gabrielle, Blue, please, she is, no, I'm why you're. Don't tell he is a blue. Fuck you. I stood up. The photo slid from my lap, landing face up. The woman beamed up at me. Michael only smirked. After a long moment, I gathered the photos up, stuffed them unceremoniously in the envelope, and ran upstairs and hid it in my dresser. I don't want Michael to find them yet. I've been thinking about this for hours. I won't lie. The portraits confuse me. I don't know what to make of them. I don't know if I want to make anything of them. I don't know if I found them this morning or if he left them. But I think I can figure out what's going on in the picture of him and the woman in the blue coat. Whoever she is, I think they're having an affair. Maybe I knew about it before. Maybe that's what sent me into a breakdown. Maybe that's why he sent me to the facility in the first place. Bad things happened to me, and he felt guilty and came to rescue me, if you will. Maybe these hallucinations are my way of dealing with it. She's an antagonist to me, a danger to my life, so I see her as a threat. Something that threatens and hurts me whenever I see her. Or maybe she isn't a hallucination. Maybe she is real. Maybe she's actually harassing me and Michael is somehow covering it up. I don't know. I don't know about her, about my illnesses, about my history, about the girl in the restaurant, about Richard, or about Thomas. But I'm going to find out. I don't know when Michael is coming home. I don't even remember where he works. I don't even know what he does for a living. But I know he'll come back tonight. And when he does, I'll confront him. One way or another, he's going to tell me what's going on. Here's a summary of everything so far. On Thursday morning, I woke up in the woods outside an impatient facility, where I've apparently been staying. I don't know how long I was there, or even why. When I woke up, I had no memory, and someone was sleeping beside me, a younger man I now know as Richard. A woman was there too, a woman in a blue coat, she told me my husband killed her sister and ran off before I could question her. Once she was gone, Richard woke up and my husband, Michael, arrived to pick me up. He didn't seem surprised that I have virtually no memory. He introduced Richard as an assistant and implied that Richard was supposed to act as some kind of babysitter while I recover. We all went out to breakfast, I guess to celebrate my homecoming. At one point, while Richard and Michael were both gone, the blue-coated woman reappeared and attacked me. She disappeared before Michael came back. That night, Michael took me out to an expensive restaurant. One of the women in the restaurant had a breakdown when she saw me and begged me to save her. From what, I don't know. Michael wrote it off as an unstable girlfriend situation. After that awful dinner with the screaming girl, I couldn't sleep. I woke up at 2.30ish and found a weird pendant in the shape of a bull's head. I played with it for maybe five minutes. When I set it down, it was somehow 7.30 a.m. Michael had already left for work. I'd lost five hours. Finally, I found three photos just sitting on the coffee table, out in the open. One of me as a child, one of Michael as a much younger man, and a recent one of Michael and the woman in the blue coat. This is significant because he keeps telling me she isn't real. And here we are. This morning, I wandered around the house for hours. I searched every room, trying to find something, anything that would explain what's wrong with me. The only locked room was Michael's office. There are two locks, a keypad, and a print reader. I tried, but there was no way. I berated myself all morning. I had so many questions and never managed to ask a single one that meant anything. Never challenged Michael's deflections. Had my life always been this way? Is that why I was in inpatient care, because I'd trapped myself with an abusive man? Enormous as it was, the house felt suffocating and false, like a model home for a little doll. What a bad little doll I am. Sometime, around 11, several sharp booms echoed through the empty living room. I nearly screamed, expecting Michael to burst through at any moment. Then it occurred to me. Michael wouldn't knock. I had a visitor. 
Thomas and the crying girl and the tittering old men from last night swept through my mind's eye, but mostly I thought of the woman in the blue coat. That's what I wanted, though, wasn't it? Michael wasn't telling me anything, but she would. Hell, she's the only one who's told me anything so far. I opened the door, expecting the worst. It was Richard. Disappointment and profound relief nearly made my knees buckle. Hi, I said. He smiled nervously. Just the person I was hoping to see. I couldn't hide my surprise. Really? Yeah, I tried to call you. Then I wanted to give it to Mr. Altair, but, well, it's not that easy. Dread coiled in my guts. The last thing I wanted to do was give Michael paperwork or some stupid trinket he left at work before I confronted him. Give what to him? Richard fished around in his pocket and extracted something. It was in my coat, at the center. I think you maybe gave it to me? To prove you were a better friend or whatever. Here. He extended his hand. A bracelet sat in his palm. It was stunning. White gold or possibly platinum, glittering with diamonds and white opals. I took it gingerly, feeling inexplicably embarrassed. Um, would you like to come in? Oh, no. He cringed, then stammered. I was actually on my way to lunch. A nervous beat. Would you like to come? I have another helmet. We can start getting to know each other since we're best friends and all. I'd already begun formulating a plan. Since you're going to be my day nurse, you mean? He swallowed hard. It's not like that. Ease up. I was kidding. Lunch sounds fantastic. He perked up considerably. I don't have any money on me, but I'll make Michael comp you. We rode into the city. He took me to a salad bar, and I, mustering all of my unremembered charm, put him at ease before moving in for the strike. Richard, can I ask you something? It's okay if you can't answer, or don't want to. He cocked his head to the side, silky hair spilled across his shoulder. This sounds ominous. It probably is. I hesitated artfully. Do you know what's wrong with me? What kind of best friend would I be if I didn't? But seriously, yeah, Mr. Altera filled me in. Don't worry, I'm really not bothered. That's not what I mean. Suddenly his expression became guarded. I rushed in. I know it sounds crazy, but I basically don't have any memory. I know who Michael is... I know I work at a theater, but that's pretty much it. I don't even know what's wrong with me, and Michael won't tell me. Sounds about right. He had to write it out for me, and it took like four days for half a page. It made him choke up. I don't think he likes thinking about it. I could barely contain my excitement. But you know? He frowned. Yeah. You really don't? No. Are you sure you want to? Positive. Sure you want me to be the bearer of bad news? I cracked a smile. Since I have the choice, I'd much rather hear it from a friend. I don't know the details, but you were badly abused as a child. Like, badly. He said you've had PTSD the whole time he's known you, but you kinda kept it under wraps or handled it or whatever. Until a dam broke. That's what he wrote down. The dam broke. Don't know the details, like I said, but you ended up checking yourself into that place to try to reset for good. Something went really wrong. I don't know anything about that, except he pulled you out and is ready to sue the shit out of them. I didn't know what to think. Couldn't even remember how to feel. How long have you been working for him? A couple of weeks. It's great, especially compared to what I was doing before. He paused. Are you okay? Look, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have- Uh, no, 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 no. I said quickly. Thank you. On impulse, I grabbed his hands and squeezed them. Thank you so much. I had so many more questions, but they weren't his to answer. I'm lucky he knew as much as he did. By that point, we'd finished eating. He went to pay the bill. I lingered at the table, wondering what to do. Go home, track Michael down at work, hang out with Richard, kicking around town like a pair of high school burnouts? Should I distract myself or focus on this new information? Focusing seemed like the adult thing to do, but if I had a past like Richard had described, did I even want my memories back? I recognized my husband, knew the specifics of my job. Wasn't that enough? Wouldn't I be better off with a fresh start? What if I was trying to undo a blessing? Richard came back, smiling sheepishly. So... He rocked back and forth on the balls of his feet. What do you like to do? 
Since I can't remember what I liked to do, we decided to do things he liked, which included rifling through an old school record store, eating churros, and wandering around the rose gardens. It was a good afternoon. I felt comfortable with him, at ease. We talked about a lot of nothing. Finally, as afternoon veered toward sunset, he opened up about himself. I've been singing since I was a preschooler. I don't have anything else. Used to sing myself lullabies. That's so sad. It's turning out kind of well lately. I'm lucky I'm working with Michael. He can open doors, and I'm hoping one will open for me. He gulped the last of a churro. What about you? What about me? What are you hoping for? I smiled easily. Friends. It was a dodge, and a stupid one at that, but he blushed a little. So are you in a band? He shook his head. Solo. I mean, I've worked with a couple of house bands, but that's all. Do you have any shows coming up? You just missed it. Suddenly self-conscious, he said. I do open mic nights, though. After some weedling, he ran home to pick up his guitar and we found a place that conveniently started open mic around lunchtime. Richard's work was beautiful. Not enough to make me forget that I was about to confront my much older, presumably much more powerful husband over a possible affair and several other issues, but the music was enough to make it seem almost unimportant. Richard's voice was ethereal, creating a vivid impression of a green-eyed girl. I idly wondered if it was based on a real person and what she might look like. Thin and tall like him, I decided. Bright red hair and milky skin to make those eyes shine like emeralds. When he finished and came back to the table, I hugged him. That was gorgeous. You'll be a superstar in no time. I'll settle for regular royalties, he said, unable to disguise how pleased he really was. I lavished him with praise for a little longer. It was the least I could do, given that he'd single-handedly created a damn good afternoon out of ashes. Then excused myself. When he asked why, I bluntly said, Bathroom. And he visibly cringed. It made me laugh. When I was halfway across the floor, I even spun around to revel in his discomfort again, but something was wrong. Right next to him, where I'd been sitting four seconds ago, was a woman with an enormous golden headdress the massive head of a bull, with an open, elongated jaw lined with improbable fangs, ropes of gemstones hung from treacherously curled horns. I blinked and she was gone. I turned hastily, hoping Richard hadn't seen my face, and nearly ran to the bathroom. Blood pounded in my ears. I felt sick and dizzy. I felt sick and dizzy, broken, like I was coming unmoored from my body and dissipating like smoke. By a massive stroke of luck, the bathroom was empty. Unable to help myself, I looked over my shoulder one last time and immediately bit back a scream. The bull stood in the center of the floor, watching me. Bright, arterial blood flowed down her thighs, pulling around her bare feet scored with hideous gashes. I blinked again. Gone. It was gone. Of course it was gone. It, it wasn't even real. And I dashed into the bathroom, locking the door behind me. I slid to the floor, my gorge rising and my tears stung in my eyes. What was I going to do? It wasn't real. It couldn't be real. So why did I have to see it? Apparently, I had already lived through horror, so why did I have to manufacture more? I furiously wiped my eyes. I didn't want Richard to know I'd been crying. I didn't want Michael to know either. I groaned. I still had to talk to him. Still had to confront him about the woman in the blue coat. How did I forget? Why had I wasted the day with a 25-year-old stranger when I had these things, these actually important things to think about? More tears threatened to pour down my face. Wanting to distract myself long enough to get back on an even keel, I pulled the bracelet out of my pocket. It was breathtaking. So beautiful, I didn't want to wear it on the motorcycle in case it flew off somehow. But it would be nice to wear it. Nice to see what it looked like on my wrist. Maybe it would feel normal. Comforting. Don't put it on! The voice cracked across the bathroom, roaring off the walls. I spun around, thinking of empty golden tables and a sadistic god coaxing screams from children, and froze. It was her, the woman in the blue coat, yet again. Rachel, don't put it on! Scared to the point of mindlessness, I thrust my hand out, offering it to her wordlessly. She reared back like a vampire from a cross. No, no, no! Put it away! Put it away now! Feeling inexplicably hurt as well as lost, I clumsily stuffed it back in my pocket. She exhaled shakily. Don't put it on. I don't care what they say. Whatever you do, don't put it on. 
Whatever you do, don't scream. Who are you? I asked, figuring it would be a good idea to get the question in before she assaulted me again. Nothing anymore. Her face twisted. A ghost. Were you Michael's mistress? Are you? She laughed, wet and thick, more like a sob than anything else. <laughs> Never. I drew a deep breath. Here it was, the real question. Why did he kill your sister? Her lips split into a snarling leer. Tears gushed down her face. Because he's such a fucking coward freak, he had to do what they said. All of them are like him. You can't trust them, not a single one. I don't know what you mean. The words issued from my throat as a miserable high keen. Her shoulders heaved and she laughed miserably. She was beautiful, delicate and fey, the features almost inhuman. I know. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a broken kitten. You're a stupid lamb. We're done. Desperate knocking shocked me out of my reverie. I jumped and whirled to the door. Just a second. What are you, fucking in there or something? The strained voice was definitely female, definitely desperate. Hurry up. Heart pounding, I turned back to the blue-coated woman. She was gone. I shuddered and covered my mouth as I started to cry. Am I crazy, or was she in fact a ghost? Impervious to the storm of knocking and swearing on the other side of the door, I washed my face. As I patted my skin dry, I noticed my eyes. My eyes, which were supposed to be blue, are green now. Olivine with flecks of copper. I didn't have time to care, not then. Praying the bull had followed the blue-coated woman into the ether, I opened the door and ducked out. Richard was waiting at the table, in clear high spirits. I shook him off, said I was suddenly ill and needed to go home. He obliged. We wound our way through traffic. The motorcycle was a miracle, navigating the gulf of vehicles three times faster than any car. Richard wanted to help me inside the house, but I didn't let him, partly from pride, mostly from fear. I immediately regretted my decision, however. The instant I stepped inside, the house seemed to bear down on me a haunted thing ready to crush its dollies flat. I tried to ignore it, tried to do what I needed to do. I retrieved the manila envelope and studied each photo within, trying to formulate my questions for Michael. But my mind wouldn't work. It was blank and sick and buzzing, carrion covered in flies. I couldn't take it anymore, so I went outside. As soon as I stepped into the sunlight, layers of anxiety and fear slowed off me like a rotten cocoon. I felt free, even safe. Re-energized and basking in the feeling of relief, I explored the yard. There wasn't much, an environmentally responsible garden of native plants, short rock walls, and an orange tree. I picked an orange and continued my rounds. When I saw a box by the back door, I didn't think anything of it. UPS or FedEx, I thought. Maybe even something that would give me an extra insight on my life. I picked it up eagerly. It was shockingly heavy for its size. No address, no postage, nothing. I shook it experimentally. The thudding shuffle indicated paperwork. Suddenly afraid, I looked around. Nothing but my empty yard, the road, and the canyon. I tucked the box under my arm and went into the kitchen. It took a long time for me to muster the bravery to open it. Sure enough, it was full of paper. It looked innocent enough, except for the note at the top. Call me right away. I stared at the handwriting, willing myself to recognize it, but it was no use. Finally, I set it aside and started in on the pile. It included a number of records and photographs. I'm overwhelmed, I can't possibly describe them all, but here's what I found out. I didn't legally exist until I was 13. I was rescued after a van crash during a high-speed chase and promptly dropped into foster care. They actually didn't even know if I was really 13. That's just what they guessed. I was rescued with five other children, including a boy named John Thomas Morrow. Four months ago, someone named John Thomas Morrow reported me missing. As of Christmas Eve, John Thomas Morrow is also a missing person. I don't work for a theater. I actually never worked for a theater. My only employment record is for the illuminatingly named Blue Industries. According to my tax returns, I'm a millionaire. Michael has four passports in as many different names. I have seven. Michael is also a licensed psychiatrist, but isn't actively practicing, so where the goddamn fuck does he go every day? I've had four stillbirths in the last 12 years. Finally, Michael and I have not been married for five years, as he claimed last night. 
We've been married for 14 years, since my legally determined 18th birthday. I didn't wait, I just gathered everything up, these papers, the photos in the manila envelope, and my computer, and left. I'm still in the city, in public, seems counterintuitive, but I think I'm safer around other people. I'm dressed well, I'm reasonably pretty, if something happens, I think people will help me. I'm at the end of my rope, I don't know who left the box of paperwork, I don't know how to find them. I'm really hoping they find me, because I don't have anywhere to go, and there's nothing I can do. I woke up in a forest with no memory. A woman in a blue coat came to me and said my husband killed her sister. Then she ran away. Lo and behold, my husband Michael appeared at that moment. When he touched me, a little bit of my memory returned. I remembered my name, Michael himself, how we met, my job, theater professional, and my boss, Thomas. That night, Michael took me out to dinner. The place was full of old men with much younger partners. Halfway through the meal, one of the young women had a breakdown and begged me to save her. Michael said we don't know her. I couldn't sleep after that, so I got out of bed at 2.30 and explored the house. At some point, I noticed a necklace on the coffee table, a pendant in the shape of a bull's head. I picked it up. Next thing I knew, it was 7.30 in the morning. Michael had left for work, and there was evidence I'd eaten breakfast with him. I'd lost five hours. The bull pendant disappeared, replaced with a manila envelope that held three weird photos. One of me as a child, one of Michael as a much younger man, and a photo of Michael and the woman in the blue coat, standing in my theater. Right at that moment, my husband's assistant, Richard, knocked and invited me out to lunch. After we ate, a monstrous bull-headed figure, one only I could see, started following me. Then the woman in the blue coat found me and told me some disturbing things. Before I could press her for answers, she disappeared yet again. When I got back home, I found a box filled with paperwork. It proved that everything, literally everything, Michael told me, is a lie. So I left my house, my husband's house, my soulless dollhouse, on Friday afternoon. I took my laptop, well, I think it's mine. It was in a computer bag with my cash-filled wallet, and the documents. Because I don't know who I am, I had nowhere to go. So I went to a diner, guzzled coffee, and poured over the papers. Police reports comprised half of it. There's so much, literally hundreds of pages, but it all boils down to this. I was sexually abused and tortured as a child. They know this because they found hundreds of hours of it on tape. Evidence suggests I was about three years old when it started. After rescuing me, the authorities tried to find my family, but it looks like I don't have one. I was imprisoned in a compound with 17 other kids, I wasn't blood-related to any of them or any of the perpetrators. I don't match any of the missing persons reports from the relevant time frame. In other words, no one ever so much as reported me as missing, let alone tried to find me. The state put me in foster care. I ran away almost immediately. Then there's nothing until my 18th birthday, when I married Michael. For the record, he's 27 years older than me. Not that you can really tell. Everything aside, he really is very good-looking. Just a couple of days ago, he claimed he's only known me for five years, which oddly is what I remember. I remember meeting him five years ago at the theater where I work. The problem here is, according to my tax returns, which were bundled in with the police reports, I've never worked for a theater. A few photos are mixed in with the documentation. One is of a bland strip mall storefront. One looks like an honest-to-god castle, one is a proper white trash shack compound, and one is of a perfectly circular clearing surrounded by oaks and pines. The clearing, castle, and compound are hopeless, no names, other landmarks, or anything trackable. For all I know, they could be 20 miles away or on the other side of the world. The storefront, however, has a name. Lucky for me, it turned out to be three short bus rides from the diner. So I decided to brave public transit in the middle of the night. While close geographically, the shop was worlds away from the diner, let alone my white-collared dollhouse life with Michael. The area was crowded and broken down, sun bleached to nothing by decades of light and relentless heat. Homeless people huddled together, giving wide berths to the unlucky individuals babbling to themselves. Rangy men and hard-lipped women lounged at the corners. I watched a convenience store clerk shoo a gaggle of them away. Minutes later, they drifted back, like leaves rolling in before a storm. One of them sidled up to me, barely visible in my periphery, 
I didn't want to look. I was afraid they'd see the fear on my face or smell the cash on me. So I stared resolutely ahead, fighting the urge to run. What are you doing? The stranger asked calmly. Not a stranger. Her again. The one who'd started this mess, who followed me everywhere and told me nothing. The woman in the blue coat. I rattled my computer bag aggressively, if you could even call a computer bag aggressive. Did you leave this? Leave what? A hundred calculated gazes bored through me as I walked. I wondered what they saw, what they thought of me. The box of papers, the police reports, the records, the- She shushed me so loudly several people turned, startled. No. She hissed. I would never do that to you. Where are you going? I picked up my pace, half hoping she'd fall behind, but the store had already come into view. The woman's gray eyes widened and she stopped. Here? Here. I adjusted my bag and strode forward. She tried to pull me back, but I shook her off as a lady nearby snickered. Rachel, please. Don't go in there. Why? I snapped. What's in there? More cryptic bullshit. I wasn't impressed. The more I saw of her, the less I feared her. In fact, she was quickly becoming a pest. Ignoring her pleas, I entered the shop. It was cool and dark, devoid of people. Rows of fold-out tables lined the walls, piled with duffel bags and stacks of unmarked discs. The carpet was thin and worn through to concrete. There was an air of neglect, of tense and temporary settlement. Cheap tables and open cases made me think these people were ready to pack up and disappear at a moment's notice. The woman in the blue coat stalked in and immediately beelined for me. Before I knew it, she was clinging to my arm, whispering a panicked litany of swear words and implorations as we approached the front of the shop. You shouldn't be here, Rachel. Rachel, please don't be here. You should go now. I stopped at the counter. Behind it, several layers of fluttering black muslin colored a small entryway. Fuck, Rachel. Shit. This is bad. You can't handle this. You're just a lamb. You aren't supposed to know. You need to go. They'll know. Shit. Fuck. God fucking damn it. I can't. You can't. A red-haired man exploded through the muslin, making me jump. The blue-coated woman's grip relaxed unexpectedly. Get out of here. The man snapped. Cold but impersonal. He reminded me of the clerk who'd chased the homeless people away. People who drifted right back like moths to a flame. I have money, I said. No. The blue-coated woman keened miserably. Just get the fuck out, lady. I said I have money. He eyed me up and down, sardonic and contemptuous and mildly leering. And I said this isn't the place for you. Get out. From behind the muslin. What's happening out there? A second man emerged, stooping to fit through the entryway. He was almost impossibly tall, with shorn black hair and long, narrow eyes. My companion tightened her grip on my arm again, fingertips digging painfully into soft flesh. The tall man looked at me, face tight and unhappy. Then suddenly, he smiled, wide and predatory, a Cheshire cat grin. You fucking moron. His tone was jolly, each syllable low and musical. This isn't a crazy. This is our bread and butter. I met the tall man's gaze resolutely, but oh how my heart fell. The redhead glanced irritably between us. The man finally sighed and said, Look at her. Look at her mouth, her hair, her eyes. Or are you that stupid? I fidgeted as the boy glared at me. It took a good minute before the recognition finally dawned on his face. His eyes brightened and a feverish, starstruck smile touched his lips. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't... I, I didn't think. Not at all unusual, I'm afraid. The tall man gave him a contemptuous look before turning to me with a smile. What have you come for, my dear? You already know. The blue-coated woman squeaked. I stared, amazed that she'd spoken. The tall man chuckled. <laughs> True, but why? None of your fucking business. Foul and beautiful as always. So, what shall it be? That lazy smile spread even farther up his cheeks, carving lines that ran from eye to chin. Your early work, or later masterpieces? All of it, said the woman. Indulging a streak of voyeuristic narcissism, are we? His smile darkened slightly. You will come back someday soon and tell me what all this is about, won't you? Without thinking, I said, Don't I always? The man pouted playfully. Not always. He straightened up briskly. Give me a few minutes. He went into the back while the redhead picked a handful of discs from various tables. 
He kept glancing over his shoulder at me with a weird combination of shyness and the kind of dirty awe that made me ill. The man returned with a sizable stack of cheap hard drives. He and the redhead wrapped and bagged them in ancient, brittle grocery sacks. While they worked, the atmosphere darkened considerably. My scalp began to prickle, and strange chills ran down my spine. I could feel clammy sweat beating at my hairline. The blue-coated woman wasn't helping. She kept shifting back and forth, grip tightening and tightening on my arms. Stop it! I finally hissed. The redhead glanced up excitedly, but the tall man gave him a warning look. The blonde woman had turned to face the front of the shop, eyes so wide I could see the reflection of the door, and of a tall, golden figure. I turned slowly, stealing myself. A great fanged bull's head, bedecked in jewels, stared back at me. It was a headdress of some kind, fantastically outsized for the distinctly feminine form. Beneath it, dark, tacky blood stained her hands and trailed down her thighs. Faint darkness emanated from her, like an anti-halo, something that not only hid the light, but consumed it. Do you see her? I whispered. Always. The woman in the blue coat whimpered. Oh. The redhead breathed dreamily. Even the tall man looked up this time, unable to conceal his excitement. The creature in the bull's head faced me for what felt like an eternity. Then she pivoted, chain jewels clattering against the golden headdress, and exited into the night. Suddenly the tall man cleared his throat. I whirled around. He handed me a bag with a differential smile. As requested? I'm sorry to ask, but... His shoulders slumped slightly, but it was a false gesture. Will compensation be forthcoming? Always, I said thinly, with no idea what I had agreed to. Would you like anything else from me? His white teeth and long, glittering eyes made my skin crawl. No, but thank you. He inclined his head respectfully. Then I hope to see you soon. The blue-coated woman practically dragged me out of the shop. Drops and trails of blood stained the ragged floor, proof that the thing with the bull's head had indeed been here. Once we exited into the night, I grabbed the woman's shoulder. What was that? My voice sounded weak and broken. The woman in the blue coat wouldn't look at me. Her name is Gabrielle. Who is she? <sighs> no one you know. Someone you have to ignore, no matter what happens. Is she real? As real as you and me. What is she? The woman shrieked in frustration and spun around, jabbing violently at my face. People around us, there were so many, many more than I'd thought, reared back and gave us a berth. Stop talking about her! She screamed. She takes enough, don't give her more! The woman ran ahead, disappearing into the nighttime throng. I chased her, sidestepping beggars and drunks, taking care not to trip on the buckled concrete. I turned the corner, heart sinking. I tore my way through the crowd. It was easier than I expected. Most of them moved out of the way long before I reached them. I searched for what simultaneously felt like hours and minutes. Finally, breathless and clutching a stitch in my side, I collapsed on a bench and surveyed my surroundings. It was 3.30 in the morning. Laughing men and cat-like women clung to storefronts and strutted between prowling cars. I was trapped for the night. Trapped in an unfamiliar, dangerous place with a computer, 2,000 useless dollars, and no way out. After a while, I stood up and started walking. I thought about finding a room and finally sleeping, but the idea scared me. Both the blue-coated woman and the thing in the bull headdress had tracked me down miles away from home in the kind of area women like me shied away from. I wasn't safe. I'd be even less safe in a strange room, alone. So I kept walking. Ten minutes? An hour? I didn't know or care. At some point, I passed a police substation. I was five blocks past it when I realized the cops could help me. I spun around and ran. Several women laughed and a man hissed appreciatively after me. I ignored them all, keeping my eyes trained on the brilliantly lit station. Light spilled from the grimy windows like white fire from heaven. It seemed so far away and I was so tired. But I had to do it. This was it. This was the answer. The cops. Safety lay just a few minutes away. I was so focused on the station that I didn't see the man sitting on the street, legs outstretched. The toe of my shoe caught his ankle and I went flying, scraping my palms bloody as I skidded to a stop. I crawled to my feet, mortified, and I turned to face my victim. The force of my stride had rolled him onto his side. As I watched, he dragged himself up and used his hands to reposition his legs. Stricken, I realized he was paraplegic. I'm so sorry. I ran over, already fumbling in my bag for money. 
I knelt at his side. His eyes traveled over my face. He looked scared, and no wonder. I... I didn't mean... He wailed loudly, deep baritone threatening to blow my eardrums. My head snapped back. He started flailing, slapping and kicking at me blindly. I skittered back, cursing myself for hurting him more. I, I'm sorry, I yelled. I, I'm sorry, I, I'll go, I'll... Someone rushed over to help him. I thought of his legs, wondering if I'd broken them, if I was about to go to jail. His wailing shrank to a mumbled snivel as the newcomer comforted him. It was another man. His voice was authoritative and soothing. The paralyzed man nodded and whimpering covered his eyes. The newcomer stood to face me. His face was drawn and tired, but not unkind. I backed away nervously, but he strode forward. When he passed under a streetlight, my mouth fell open. Thomas. Thomas, the boss I remembered from my job at the theater. The job I'd never had at the theater that didn't exist. A figment of my imagination, before me in the flesh. I wanted to look at him, to touch him, to prove he was real but my feet drove me backward, somehow independent of my own will. He held his hands up in a non-threatening gesture. It's alright. He's alright. I'm alright. I just want to check on you. It's because you took a bad fall, okay? Thomas approached faster than I could retreat, and before I knew it, he had a hand on my shoulder, soothing me the way he'd soothed the screaming man. He leaned down and inspected my hands. I couldn't look away from him. Up close, there was no question. Hollow cheeks, thin mouth, smooth hair, and above all, his eyes. Clearest light brown, just a shade away from gold. Thomas, I murmured. He gave me a keen, quizzical look. No, but funny. You're not the first one who thinks that's my name. I cleared my throat and straightened up, willing him to see me, to recognize me as I'd recognized him, to confirm something, anything. I think I know you. He moved back a little, body language shifting from conciliatory to smoothly eager. He gave a coy smile. I think I'd remember you. I backed away, confused. You'd be surprised. His eyes reflected the yellow street lamps, cat-like, almost chilling. Either way, I wouldn't mind getting to know you. All at once, I understood what was going on. Heat stung my eyes, threatening tears. He was a prostitute my boss, or whoever he actually was. Don't you know me? I asked. His veneer cracked for a fraction of a second before that silky smile reappeared. Long, playful, lazy, like a Cheshire cat. I'd like to. Thomas, I repeated desperately. Thomas, you're, you're my boss. You didn't like me, but then you did, or, or maybe not, but one night something happened. I heard you cry... I don't know what, but I don't remember anything after. You told me about my husband. You told me Michael was an original bluebeard, and something happened. I don't know what. Do you? Do you remember any of this? The smile dropped away, leaving confusion and fear. His eyes searched mine desperately, flicking back and forth across my face. Little boy lost and a little girl lost, trying to find themselves in each other's eyes. Frown lines cut his face deeply, each one filling with horror before my eyes. You can't be here. He retreated, eyes growing wider by the second. I know you can't be here. I reached for him, not knowing what to do or say, only wanting to keep him with me. The second my fingertips brushed his skin, he reared around and slapped me. Stars rocketed across my vision. He ran to the paralyzed man, who was small. I saw, younger and so much smaller than I'd realized picked him up and hurried away. As he turned the corner, the streetlights dimmed and everything suddenly sounded muffled. I already knew what was coming. The long, cruel horns appeared first, followed by the snout and the fanged maw. Ropes of gemstones swayed and clinked as the bull trudged into view. The headdress looked insane, ornate and elaborate and horrifying, almost half as tall as the woman who wore it. The bull stopped when it saw me. I tried to see what lay beyond the headdress, but it was no use. It was too deep, too far, too dark. With a great lurch, it staggered toward me. I ran. The police station looked farther away than ever, but it couldn't have been. I was closer, getting closer every step. Never mind the clatter of chains and the jewels echoed behind me. Never mind, never mind. And suddenly, I was there, inside the bright waiting room, squinting against the onslaught of blinding light. I stumbled up to the counter, 
even through my terror, I was dimly aware of the clerk's bored, unimpressed competence. Before I knew it, I was sitting across from a sergeant in a back room, jabbering wildly about dreams and fake passports, memory loss and child abuse, screaming girls in restaurants and laughing old men, blonde women in blue coats and great jeweled bulls with things like an ape. When I finished, the sergeant gave me a long, disbelieving stare. Then, What is this? Practice? She laughed heartily. My breath caught in my throat. That's good, she said. It ever comes to it and they can't help their golden girl. You'll be fine. She stood up and left the room. The door clunked shut. I stared at it blearily, trying to understand what had just happened. When it finally clicked into place, I shot up and ran to the door. I desperately pulled at the handle. It was locked, of course. Locked as lock could be. I screamed and rattled and pounded the door. No one came. I thought of cameras and compounds, dark vans and filthy arenas, of being twelve years old and nameless, forgotten and lost, of being so worthless no one ever tried to find me. Finally, the door opened a fraction. I pawed at it frantically, trying to pull, then realized my body was blocking it. I pulled myself to my feet and stepped away, sobbing with relief as it swung open. Michael entered, disheveled and frantic. Before I could move, he was on me, hugging and patting me down tenderly, voice breaking as he tried to soothe me. Of course, I didn't want to go with him. Of course, I screamed and fought and begged for help. After tolerating it for a minute or so, the cops told me I had three choices. Go home with my husband, say hello to a 5150 hold, or trundle off to jail. So it turns out, I'm a vulnerable adult and Michael has complete legal authority over me. I have no autonomy. Even if I went to jail or a mental hospital, he'd be waiting to grab me the second I stepped outside. Since it was just a matter of time, I agreed to go home with him. He couldn't stop crying even after we started driving. He was quiet, but obvious. Tears streamed down his face and every breath hitched constantly. I was afraid he was going to wreck the car. At one of the numerous red lights, I finally said, I, I saw Thomas tonight. Why would you do that? He shouted. It wasn't on purpose. The oh, fuck me, it wasn't on purpose. Why did you go to that store, huh? He reached across and rattled the bag, spilling discs and drives across my feet. Why did you get these? Why did you take them into the police station, Rachel? Do you even know what they are? It's my body of work, I answered miserably. Why do you have them? What are you hoping to see? They knew me, I said. The people at the store. Of course they fucking knew you! How the hell is that possible? I screamed. He drew a deep breath, lost it to a sob, and inhaled again. You're prolific. His lip trembled. Tears spilled down his cheeks, soaking his short, impossibly neat beard. Famous. He released a shoulder-racking sob. They were meeting their favorite celebrity, Rachel. My gorge rose. Except for his crying, we were silent for a long time. Finally, I said, Who is Thomas? His face twisted. They found him with you when you were children. You were close, so they put you in a home together. Don't you remember? I shook my head. He covered his eyes and I held still for another long while. When his hands finally dropped away, his face was blotchy, and for the very first time, there was no vitality to him, no youthful aspect or preternatural handsomeness. He just looked tired and old. After they put you in the same home, he started hurting you, raping you. It's why you ran away, and why you had so much trouble. How did I meet you? I asked. You were my patient. I fell in love with you. You're a psychiatrist. No, I lost my license for marrying you. I am a PR now. When did we get married? Five years ago this May. This is what I'd been waiting for. No! I shrieked triumphantly. He stared back, panic apparent in his face. I shuffled around in my computer bag and pulled out fistfuls of papers. You married me when I was 18. I have proof. You have fake passports, fake names, fake licenses. The sheer rawness of his pain was too much. I couldn't keep going, couldn't face it anymore, and I started to cry. The document slid from my hands and I leaned forward, resting my head against the dashboard. His hand quickly found mine. After a while, once I'd calmed down, he drew me close and hugged me fiercely. Let me see the papers, okay? His tears dampened my hair. We'll look at them together. 
We did, and it quickly became obvious that most of the pages were blank. Only the police reports were as I remembered. The photos, the records, the documents, gone, non-existent. Only pristine sheets of blank white paper. I don't think I've cried harder in my life. Michael held me while I wept, whispering senseless bits of comfort and stroking my hair. When I'd finally cried myself out, he drove me back to the house. It was still dark, but I imagined I could see the first hints of lightness in the sky. When we got inside, he pulled me to him, caressed my face, and kissed me gently. Wanted some semblance of intimacy and safety, and ultimately wanted him. So I took the lead. It was quick and satisfying, and we drifted to sleep as the morning sun broke over the canyon. I woke up yesterday afternoon. Michael was still asleep, arms slung loosely across my hip. His beating was rhythmic. I willed it to lull me back to sleep, but no luck. I was wide awake and unwilling to wake my exhausted husband just yet. I moved his arm carefully and slipped out of bed. After making sure he hadn't woken, I went downstairs to make coffee. When it was finished, I prepared two cups, one for me and one for him. I figured it was the least I could do. On my way back up, something caught my eye. Something in the downstairs hallway. Light. Maybe Michael had left the switch on last night. I detoured into the corridor, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. A pale bar of light spreading across the carpet. Daylight spilling through an open door. Michael's office door. I looked over my shoulder and listened. Nothing to see, nothing to hear. I counted to sixty, then pushed open the door to the only unknown room in my perfect dollhouse. It is a big room, an enormous room, a room that seems far too big to fit in the house. It's also beautiful, hardwood floors and a sleek wooden ceiling, with mahogany furniture. In the center of the room are four display stands. They are huge, easily long and wide enough to hold a human body. Two of them are empty. Two of them are, in fact, displaying bodies. Women's bodies. One looks just like me. Her hair is maybe a shade lighter, just a tiny bit more golden, but that's the only difference. Her skin is mottled white and purple, and she has a curiously twisted body. Her toes are yellowish and curled. Every time I look at them, I think of chicken claws. The second body, still as death but fresh as spring, is that of the woman with the blue coat. Her pale hair gleams like precious metal, and her skin is translucent. I can trace the paths of a dozen sapphire veins from across the room. They're both naked, except for necklaces. The blonde one is wearing a sapphire necklace I recognize from the photograph that was somehow disappeared. The one of her and Michael in the theater that does not exist, and the one that looks like me, the one who has been dead for a much longer time, is wearing the bull's head pendant. The cup slid from my hands. I was dimly aware of ceramic shattering on the floor. I backed away, reaching blindly for the door. The second I touched the solid wood, I heard his voice. God damn it, Rachel. The words held no venom, only tiredness and a hint of sorrow. I slammed the door in his face and locked it. Handle, deadbolt, padlock. There are three on the outside, three within. It has created quite the standoff. When you're able to talk, he said clearly voice only slightly muffled. I'll be in the kitchen. After that, silence. I wondered if he'd left. Then, please, don't be afraid. I heard the tears in his voice, the abject misery. It was almost enough to make me melt. The floor creaked as he stepped away, and sure enough, I heard kitchen noises, cabinet doors and running water, the clink of silverware and the distinctive hiss of the frying pan. In spite of everything, the scent of the food made my mouth water. Even now, the two corpses laid out ten feet away, notwithstanding, the memory makes my stomach rumble. I've been in here for hours, all night. I'm hungry and thirsty and tired, and my bladder is killing me. There's a computer in here, but it's useless. I don't have anyone to email, no Facebook profile to update. I created an email to send a message to the sheriff's office, but I haven't heard anything. It's probably for the best. All I can think of is the laughing sergeant from last night basically telling me, bravo. I tried to look myself up online, but found nothing. I made a Facebook account and started adding random people. Most rejected the request. A few accepted, but they're disappearing from my profile as quickly as I can add them. I don't know why. I got an angry message just now bitching me out for deleting them. All my pleas for help keep disappearing from my wall, too. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. 
There's no cell phone in here, certainly no landline. The window faces the canyon, the wide open canyon where our closest neighbor is over a mile away. I've been watching the bodies. I'm afraid. I think my doppelganger is moving. Not by much, twitches and little shifts here and there. But the twitches and little shifts are things livid corpses should not be doing. You know, I really wish I'd gone to jail when I had the chance. It's a quarter past seven. I've been in here since Saturday afternoon. The dead girls are moving. He's on the other side of the door, begging me to come out. I'm so tired. Whatever he does won't be worse than what's already happened. I'm going to unlock the door. I wasn't particularly upset when the dead girl started moving. It was probably due to my dehydration, hunger, and exhaustion rather than bravery, but nevertheless, their twitches and jerks weren't enough to chase me out of my husband's office. When they started talking, though, that was another matter entirely. There were two women laid out on display tables in Michael's office. A pale lady with blonde hair and ivory skin who'd been following me for days, and a half-rotten woman who, except for mottled skin, curled toes, and receding lips, looked just like me. She was the more vocal of the two. She kept spouting gibberish in a creaky, horribly wet whisper, whereas the blonde girl kept whispering for help. Cloudy gaze drifting emptily around the room. She didn't seem to notice me or anything. Her eyes traveled over me just as they did the walls, the window, and the decomposing doppelganger. Maybe she was blind, or maybe I'd cease to exist. Either option was fine with me. My rotting double moaned, then hissed, You have to make sacrifices, Rachel. Up until that point, murderous husband, false memories, bloody revenants and all, I'd done pretty well, but at that point, I was done. Hearing my name issue from that dead, cracked mouth finally broke me. I bounded across the massive office in one, two, three leaps. For a terrible moment, I was afraid I was trapped. The door to my husband's office had three locks inside, but it also has three locks on the outside. I'd successfully locked him out, but had he locked me in? He'd been begging me to come out for hours, but what if he hadn't disabled his half of the locks? We all have to make sacrifices, Rachel. Her voice was a soft, dry whisper, leaves scraping against buckled concrete. I have memories to show you. I turned the locks with shaking hands. One by one they opened, each giving way with a satisfying metallic thud. My doppelganger suddenly sat up, leaving a discolored puddle of viscous fluid on the display table. The door flew open, clipping my cheekbone. As pain screamed across my face, a pair of strong, familiar hands reached and pulled me out, then slammed and shut the door. Lock it! I shrieked. Lock it! Lock it! Lock it! There's no need, Michael said evenly. I shoved him away and tried to run. He grabbed my wrist, gripped like a vice. After a brief scuffle, he pulled me in, crushing me to his chest. Don't be afraid of me. You're a murderer. He drew such a deep breath that his ribs pressed painfully against my face. I need you to listen to me. Afterward, do whatever you want. You can leave. If that's what you want to do, I will help you. But first, we need to talk. I should have refused, should have punched, bit, flailed, screamed. I should have done whatever it took to hurt him and get away. But I was so scared and so tired, so lonely and so lost. He's the only familiar thing that I have, the only thing I know. His embrace, that tight, crushing hold, was the first thing that felt right since I woke up in the forest. Okay, I said. Good. Now trust me. He opened the door before I could stop him. I drew back, expecting to see my dead double standing at the threshold. But no, it was worse. The room was smaller, so much smaller than it had been just a minute ago. Less than half the size, with desk and furniture scaled down to fit. The four large display stands, including the ones with corpses, were gone, replaced with podiums. No bodies for a blessed second. Then the room stretched again, everything erupting to twice its size just beyond the threshold. Wet things flickered into existence behind the podiums, dark bones imperfectly coated with sinew and damaged flesh, slowly building their way into broken bodies. One had unmistakable blonde hair peeking through her ruined scalp. One still looked just like me. 
A kind of wet, labored thumping caught my attention. It came from the third podium, which had been an empty table just a moment ago. The thing making the sound was fleshy and small, bloody and dark, pulsating violently as if it were trying to jump away. A heart. A disembodied heart shot through with veins of rot and glistening white worms. It flailed, squirting strings of pus and coagulated blood with each irregular beat. One heavy lurch dislodged a maggot, shooting it across the room, slapping the floor inches from my feet. Michael shoved me back, and I stomped on the worm. The thick squelch made my gorge rise. What is this? I asked. My eyes darted back and forth, trapped on the rotten body of my doppelganger before catching on the burnt body of the blonde woman, all serenaded by the heart's awful, corruptive beat. Come into the kitchen, Michael said gently. He got behind me and placed both hands on my shoulders. Some of my horror dissipated. In fact, I was almost calm. I let him guide me into the dining room. He fed me dinner. Neither of us spoke while I ate, which was fine. So fine, in fact, that I found myself chewing longer and dragging out the time between bites. But it came to an end, as all things do, and eventually I pushed my plate away and raised my eyes to my husband's face. I need you to come outside, he said. So I did. He led me by the hand across our property. It was huge, so much larger than I remembered. Behind the house, already situated at least a hundred yards from the road, was a steep slope. Beyond that lay a miniature plain lined with eucalyptus and fruit trees. Their leaves glinted under the moonlight, creating a dim ring of silver. Michael pulled me in among the trees. We moved too quickly. Rocks and fallen branches lurked in the shadows. I must have tripped six or seven times before we reached the pit perfectly round and ringed in stones. It looked like a still, black pool in the darkness. I thought it was water until my toes were touching the rim. Michael pulled me back sharply, and I saw that it wasn't a pool, it was a pit. A horrific flash of memory hurtled through my mind. We love it when you scream. But I shoved it away. This was not the time for dreams or even memories, however important. What is it? I asked. A gate, I suppose. I turned around to look at him, to search his face for something, for anything. His eyes were terribly bright in the dark, heterochromatic, one green and one blue, eyes I usually found intoxicating, but tonight only seemed very wrong. To what? Shall I tell you what you told me many years ago? If it's relevant. He gave me a small smile, then recited as if by heart. Beyond the empire we do not see lies a world we cannot imagine. His eyes were too intent, too bright, the eyes of a fanatic. I looked away from him and at the pit instead, and immediately regretted it. No longer serene, the pit gaped, a wound bleeding even more shadows into the night. The world we can't imagine is coveted by the people who own us. None of this was familiar, not a word. Was it another lie, or another delusion? Even though they want it, they don't understand what they can do with it. They're too mired in their own wealth and fleeting power. They are so small-minded, so obsessed and assured of their place that they ignore the entire apple tree for the spoiled fruit on the ground. They understand only the tide pool, with no concern for the ocean beyond it. Wait. That was familiar. The image of tidal pools, black tide pools under a green sky, sea foam fired to bloody copper by a red sun. They think everything is for them. The only interest they have in this world, this vast, incomprehensible ocean, is in using it, manipulating it to solidify their power and money here. They think they can control the ocean. They think they can force the sea to fill their tide pool to the brim and send it away when they're done with it. The black ocean roiled, jagged peaks of black, glistening flesh crested over the waves, then rose and rose and rose until it blacked out the sky and blotted out the sun. Then it opened, an eye, a great single eye as bright as the stars and dark as the abyss, and then it opened on another one, and another, and another, until a thousand eyes filled the body and the sky. Michael shifted. Twigs crackled and dry dirt rustled beneath his feet, shattering my reverie. They can't get into this ocean, Rachel. But we can. 
They send us to gather its water for their own ends, without understanding what they're drinking. His hand was wrapped around mine, familiar fingers gently lacing between my own. Do you remember this? I shook my head, nausea roiled in my stomach, and my head felt light. Shadows were too dark, blending into the glassy, dizzying brightness of the moon on the trees and dirt and pit. But you feel it. And that's enough. I'm going to show you what you showed me many years ago. He wrapped an arm around my waist, fingertips pressing into my stomach, holding tight. I couldn't move if I'd wanted to. He moved toward the pit, forcing me along with him. The blinding moonlight and consuming shadows mesmerized me. I felt like I had a fever, that the trees and ground and moon would break their bounds and spill out, bleeding together and creating something new, something I could not and never would understand. Michael stepped off the rim of the pit, and before I knew what had happened, we were falling. 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 And then I was standing, instinctively digging my heels into wet ground as gales of wind pummeled the earth, driving up cyclones of sand and shells that stung my face and bit my hands. A wild, unearthly sky swirled with ethereal green and deep pearlescent blue, stretching to a bank of hideous brown storm clouds on the far horizon. Beneath it lay a vast ocean. At first glance, black, but in truth too rich with color to comprehend. Blazing silver and rich ruby red, sapphire and emerald and white and gold, all deepened by colors I couldn't name or even compare to the ones I knew. Something beyond fear, beyond panic or terror or horror, suffused me. It was almost paralytic, but not quite. My mind was too shallow, too nascent, too unformed to fully understand. And thus, unable to fully react, I was just an ant witnessing the explosion of an atomic bomb. Out of the incomprehensible distance, something between the storms and the shore were figures. Great, unnatural wreaths of shadow flailing and roiling in the waves. I couldn't look at them for long. I tried, but physically couldn't. No matter how I focused, my head would turn, or my eyes would look up to the sky or down at the sand. My body knew what my mind refused to accept. Whatever they were, I was not capable of seeing them. I tried to move forward, to explore, to go down to the water and touch it, but Michael's arm tightened hysterically around my waist, forcing me to stay in place. Do you remember? And even though he screamed, I had to struggle to hear him, because the wind picked up his words and carried them away. Perhaps to the beings in the water, I didn't want them to have my words, to know my voice, so I shook my head. He pulled me back. It was much easier than going forward because the wind was on our side. He turned and pointed. I struggled to see, through the rain of the sand and the debris, a hundred shapes, a thousand rocks and cliffs and alien trees, mountains in the distance ringed by violet clouds. Then I saw it, or rather, them. A man and a woman, both extraordinarily beautiful, with perfect mouths and a chiseled smoothness on the planes of their faces. But that perfection ended at the nose. From forehead to eye, their faces were wet death's heads. The woman hid in the water, staring up at the man, who peered down from a cliff. Fury and sorrow, lust and hate, emanated from their bodies. Even from such a distance, it was a nearly physical force. It broke my heart and made me ecstatic and angry all at once. Michael covered my eyes, filled with visions of apocalyptic storms and wet skulls of being thrown in churning seas and abandoned again. I flailed and kicked and even tried to bite him, but he was too strong. He always was and will be for a long while yet. I was trapped. Whatever he wanted to do would be done. And suddenly, it was warm and quiet. I was gagging on clouds of dry dust, curled on my side, somewhere in my husband's orange grove as stars and satellites glimmered overhead. I disentangled myself from Michael and sat up. Where did we go? Go. You never told me where or what it was. He sat up with a grimace and shook dust and sand from his hair. Reflexively, I ran my fingers through mine. Sure enough, it was damp and flecked with sand and frizzy. I started to laugh, and of course, that quickly developed into crying. I thought of the man and the woman, of the beauty of their mouths and bodies juxtaposed against the wet, fungal horror of their eyes of blonde stalkers and dead doppelgangers, of old men laughing at screaming girls and bullheaded monsters prowling streets where forgotten victims tried to live. Michael reached for my hands, but I flung them away. 
I still don't understand. Tell me what you don't understand. I shrieked a volley of questions. What is any of this? How did I forget? Why do people know me everywhere I go? And why the ever-loving fuck are there dead women in your house? My voice echoed off the trees, hysterically accusatory. I don't know. Michael answered. You brought them here. A sob caught in my throat. I couldn't breathe, couldn't even choke. You brought them here from that... that other place. That other plane. He propped himself up and looked at me. He didn't look his age tonight, not even close. If I hadn't known him, I'd have guessed twenty years younger, maybe more, and beautiful as always. I looked away quickly, unexpectedly disturbed, and struggled to remember his words. It was hard. My mind was a mess, a buzzing, whirling, screaming mess. What had he said? We gather water for people who don't even know what they're drinking? Who do we gather the water for? He sat up, demeanor suddenly cold. The people who own us. Who owns us? This is not something I will tell you tonight. His voice was suddenly so thick, so much so it was unfamiliar. Between it and the distance in his body language, he might have been a stranger. Come. He stood up, brushed himself off, and extended a hand to me. I stared up at him uncertainly, then took it. He hauled me to my feet and led me back to the house. The clock in the living room said it was 3.42 in the morning. We'd set out at 8.30 in the evening. We reached the pit within ten minutes. The foray into that other place couldn't have been more than a minute or two. But here we are, seven hours later. Michael readied for bed wordlessly. I tried to follow his lead, but I had one more question. One I was sure he had the answer to. I had a dream the other night, I said. And? He was scrubbing his face, rinsing the sand from his skin and beard and hair. Actually, I think it was a memory. Anything regarding our experience this evening? I don't know. In it, I was a child, in a pit, like an arena with other children. You were in a mansion, or maybe a palace. People were all around the pit, waiting in front of empty plates as you fought. He said flatly. I fought off a terrible wave of nausea. Yes, that pit reminded me of this one. It should. It's the same type of thing, the same idea. He briskly dried his face. You are uniquely talented. They are not, so they need other things, other ways. I took a deep breath and held it. Like what? I think you know. He hung the towel and went back to the bedroom. Come to bed. I hesitated, which hurt him. The pain was evident in his posture. Fine. Sleep where you like. Sleep in the office. Maybe your pets will help you remember who you are. Don't be stupid. I tried to keep my voice steady, but failed miserably. I wasn't... I'm just tired. His expression softened a bit. Let's sleep. We did. At least, I did. It came fast, and it was deep and dreamless. I woke in the morning. The quality of the light was too pale and too golden for it to be anything but early, but I wasn't sleepy anymore. In fact, I was wide awake. I rolled over, reaching absently for Michael, but he wasn't there. I sat up and pulled at the rumpled covers to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. Since more sleep was out of the question, I got up and checked the bathroom. No Michael. Figuring he was probably making breakfast, I put on a robe and left the room. As soon as I reached the top of the stairs, I heard voices. Michael's, of course, and someone else's, younger, far more emotional, and very familiar. Richard. Michael stood at the front door, blocking the entry. Richard was on the porch, every inch of him confrontational. I remember everything. His words were a curious combination of rage, fear, and triumph. I know everything again. Michael's voice, sharp by contrast, was smooth and dangerously level. What do you expect from me? Does she- Richard's voice became ragged. Does she remember? No, said Michael. They watched each other for what felt like a long time. I'm going to tell her. Richard stepped back quickly, as if preempting an attack. You know what will happen. I don't know why you have a second chance, but I do know you won't get a third. She needs to know! Richard's voice was raw again. If she does, she will never forgive you. I know. 
The words came out in a keening, weepy whine, one that reminded me of the girl in the restaurant, the stranger who'd begged me to protect her. But no! Michael's voice was venom, cold and corrosive. He stepped back and prepared to close the door, but Richard launched himself forward and pulled it open. What's wrong with you? Don't you want her to win? That memory again, hideous and horrifying. This is how you win. This isn't up to me, or to you. A measured pause. I can't stop you from doing whatever you see fit, but Richard, if you interfere, you will die. He closed the door and stood until the last echo of Richard's motorcycle faded. Then he ran his hands through his hair and went down the hall to his office. I'm lost as ever. I don't think it's possible to find out the entire truth of things anymore. But I can try, and I know where to start. There are corpses in Michael's office, corpses that know things I have forgotten, corpses that want to speak. He's locked himself in there now, and I'm sure he'll lock it when he leaves, but that's all right. Locks won't keep me out anymore. Last night, I dreamed of hearts and rot, of men in mirrored wolf's masks, of fat maggots squirming toward the yawning pit filled with roiling water, and of golden people eating bloody meat off jeweled plates as children screamed. I woke with a start. A cool, familiar hand covered my forehead. What are your dreams about? Michael asked quietly. Dead sisters, I answered without hesitation, barely understanding what I was saying. And brothers... He soothed me back to sleep, into another nightmare I still don't remember. I only remember waking up at 9.13 in the morning, soaked with sweat, hair so damp it looked like I'd just showered, or maybe taken a swim in the ocean. Michael, of course, was gone. A handwritten note was folded on his pillow that said, I was called to work, I had to go, I'll be back as soon as I can. I reread it, wondering why he didn't just leave a text message. Then I realized I didn't have a phone. On the heels of that galloped another realization. I don't remember going to bed. I remembered standing at the top of the stairs, eavesdropping as Michael and Richard exchanged threats. After that, I only remember Michael gently whispering me awake in the dark. And then it was suddenly morning, and there I was, alone again with nothing but my fractured memories in a mind I couldn't trust. I was afraid. But why? This was good. Hell, this was great. With Michael gone, I could break into his office, leave the house, maybe even find Richard. I couldn't do any of these things if Michael was here. Talk about luck. So why did I hesitate? I showered and dressed myself, then ate as heartily as I could. I learned already that not eating was the worst thing I could do, especially if I planned to leave the house. After eating, I dithered. I checked the entire house, peeked out at the driveway for Michael's car, and briefly panicked when I realized I had no idea what it even looked like. Then I stepped out the back door and scanned the property. There was nothing, which was neither a surprise nor a relief. I went back inside, ignoring a pang as the dry heat gave way to air-conditioned sterility. As soon as the back door clicked shut, the knocking started. Slow and desperate, as if each thud took the very last of a dying person's strength, it echoed down the hall from Michael's office. Somehow, they knew he was gone, and they knew I was awake. Timidly, I tiptoed down the hall and knelt by the door. The heavy wood continued to rattle in its frame, more frantically with every second. I imagined I could see the impact, see the door bulging from the middle in defiance of its physical limitations. I closed my eyes and splayed my hand against the door. The wood gave one last judder and fell still. Without opening my eyes, I asked, Do you still have memories to show me? I anticipated the dry hiss of my rotting doppelganger, but what issued forth was worse. Something wet and alive corrupted, like she'd started to grow back and it had gone terribly, terribly wrong. What do you want to show me? You have to open the door. This was a clear, tired voice I recognized, one that inexplicably brought tears to my eyes. The woman in the blue coat. We unlocked it inside. My hand reflexively went to the keypad, which lay beneath two padlocks. I, I can't. But you need to let us out. Her words were shrill and plaintive, and for the first time bore the traces of an accent. I don't have the code or the keys. Look down, gurgled my double. I did. Shadows danced in the scant space between the carpet and the door, a sliver no more than half an inch thick. Then fingers emerged, 
coated in blistered flesh. The crack under the door was too small for them. Blackened curls of skin peeled away from the red skin beneath as it scraped against the wood. I promised to protect you, the woman said sadly. I said I would never hurt you. I don't want to undo everything, but if I'm going to protect you, I have to hurt you this time. I'll only show you what you need to know. Her fingers were hideously bright against the carpet, puffy and oozing foul yellow fluid. Do I have to touch you? I asked, unable to help myself. You do. I close my eyes again and blindly lay my palms against her burnt fingers. They were too soft and painfully hot to the touch, and then they were merely soft and warm and then gone. I opened my eyes and found myself staring at a pair of knees. I looked up and it was her. She looked different though. Her hair was long and she no longer wore a blue coat. She also seemed older somehow. She knelt down, took my hands and gave me a kind smile. She wasn't beautiful. Her mouth was thin and long, cheekbones low, features unremarkable, but the warmth in her expression made her beautiful to me. She picked me up and the next thing I knew, I was taller, bigger, and curled on a mattress on a concrete floor. The thin mattress did nothing to mask the dank, bone-numbing chill of the room. Every part of my body hurt. The skin of my face felt raw and swollen. She knelt by my head, gently finger-combing my dirty, sweaty curls. After a while, she stood up and moved on to another mattress. Another numb child curled up in agony. I felt a violent stab of jealousy, but couldn't compel myself to move. Suddenly, I was older again, in a different place and time I recognized. I was following men in mirrored masks down into the pit in the palace. One of three dozen filthy children with bony limbs and fevered eyes. Tables lined the pit, as always, set with empty plates that glittered with jewels. I tried to stop the memory, but despite my best efforts, the voice of an insane god screeched down while a man in a wolf mask whispered instructions to me, and then I was attacking the other children, tearing out handfuls of hair and pummeling their faces, jamming fingers into their eyes and smashing their heads against the smooth, round walls of the pit. I thought it was over then, but no. The memory continued into unfamiliar territory. The pit was filled with small, broken bodies, broken bodies I'd made. Only one other child was unscathed, a rangy little boy with dark gold eyes and a dull, matted tangle of black hair. We circled each other wearily. I scanned the arena, trying to plot roots over fallen bodies and slicks of blood. Then someone stepped forward. The man in the wolf mask. The one who'd saved my life. The one who had eyes like Michael's. He picked me up and held me close. Together, we stared down at the black-haired boy, who glanced around painfully, hoping, probably, for someone to pick him up too. Applause rose, vast and deafening like a colossal flock of birds, like waves crashing on a shore in the middle of a storm. I looked up and saw the woman in the blue coat standing at the rim of the pit. I willed her to look at me, but her eyes were fixed on the golden-eyed boy. The wolf man turned and carried me out of the pit. The others followed him in procession. Mirror masks flashing white and gold with every step. You aren't finished, he whispered. No matter what they do to you, you can't scream or he will win. I knew instinctively who he was. The black-haired boy with the caramel eyes. The one the blonde woman loved more than me. What are they going to do? I asked. Things other people have done before, but worse. The procession filed into a kind of antechamber with nothing but a great sunken bath. The wolfman left me there and exited. The procession followed him out, silent and eerie, undulating like a giant snake. Finally, at the very end of the procession came the boy. The blonde woman held him by the hand. Another violent flare of jealousy burnt my insides. She bathed us both. Dirty hair came clean, knots brushed out, mats clipped away, dirt and grime slid off my skin and grungy swirls snaking off into the clean water. Outside the room, noise swelled steadily, music and laughter and breathless swells of excitement, all underscored by a heavy, organic rhythm I couldn't understand. It almost sounded like a heart, a giant heart, each beat thrumming through the marble floors. The woman with the golden hair took her time bathing us. She tried to smile occasionally, but her mouth was thinner than ever and broken somehow, 
like she was having trouble deciding whether to smile or scream. Sometimes her eyes went flat, like there was nothing in her at all, leaving me with the skin-crawling feeling that an automaton was tending to me. Outside, the laughter grew more savage and the heartbeat sped up. No longer thud, thud, but thud, 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 thud. The woman dried me carefully and in a single deft movement slid a white shift dress over my head. Silky folds fell past my knees with a soft, hushed whisper. She draped an identical one over the black-haired boy. He looked stupid. Maybe the woman made a mistake, or maybe they'd run out of boys' clothes. There'd been a lot more boys than girls in the pit, after all. The woman pulled us both close and held us for a long time. I pressed my ear to her stomach, trying to block out the monstrous heartbeat and the screaming gales of laughter beyond the doors. Are we going to sleep now? The boy asked, hopefully. The prospect brought a twinge of relief, but I remembered the wolfman's warning. You aren't finished. No, I said. The woman drew a sharp breath, then gently disentangled herself. She took each of us by the hand and led us to the doors. The boy squirmed slightly. His eyes were enormous, feverish. Are you coming with us? The woman shook her head soundlessly. She stopped at the door, let go of my hand, and rapped three times. Outside, the revelry stopped. Eerie silence reigned, broken only by the bone-shaking heart rhythm. The door swung open, revealing chaos. Dirty plates filled the tables, wet-looking bones littered the floor, while people crowded around the pit. They had the essence of being caught, frozen in the middle of a revelry. They stood and sat and kneeled and lay, twisted around to watch us enter. Most of them wore no clothes. I felt the blood drain from my face. In addition to their masks, a few of them wore round, glistening hats with holes like eyes. I tried to get a better look as the blonde woman guided me through the throng, but couldn't make sense of them. They looked broken and wet, almost bloody. The crowd parted for us, wordless and still. The heavy thud continued, growing more intense as we approached the pit. The floor vibrated under my feet with every step, so intense I was afraid I would lose my footing. We stopped at the rim. I gasped. Down below, where the dirty stone floor had been just an hour ago, was a deep bowl of light, a reverse dome. I saw trees with violet leaves shaking violently in a wind I couldn't feel or hear. Silver clouds scudded across a dreamy green sky shot through with churning swirls of blue and yellow. It was from the pit that the great heaving thud issued. I craned my neck, trying to see beyond the edges of the dome. The woman's grip tightened dramatically on my wrist. She knelt. I followed her lead clumsily, still transfixed by the rich, alien landscape just a tumble away. I stole a glance at her and at the black-haired boy. They trained their eyes on the ground, ignorant to the wondrous landscape inches from their faces. Could they not see it? How was that possible? The woman kissed each of us on the top of our heads, then stood up and walked away. As she retreated, the bodies around us shifted, roiling like a wave, and a collective sorceration passed over my head. I shot one more look at the dome, then glanced at the boy. He was looking at me with an expression too hard and too afraid for childhood. As I watched, a man came up behind him, so close his toes tingled playfully in the white cloth. A shadow slid across us, a deep tide of anti-light. It was too large for me to comprehend from my position on the floor, but I thought I recognized the shape of a heavy snout and enormous, cruel horns. Then I felt hands on my neck, probing, predatory, violating, and then one more on my chest, my waist, my ankles as the body slithered forward, too hot and too damp and far, far too big. I reached down desperately, trying to dive headlong into the dome. My hand plunged in, and suddenly the heartbeat became much more consuming, suddenly painful but liberating. It was a good pain, a whole body pain, a transformative pain, and if I could just get away, just slip inside the dome. But they dragged me back, these cackling, squalling people, shrieking with laughter. But just before my hand left the pit, my fingers convulsed on something slick and fresh and damp, tearing it away, leaving me with a handful from another world. A dream world. One I disappeared into as I suffered yet another horror. It didn't do anything for the pain, but somehow it stopped me from screaming. When they were done, and I was back in the antechamber, bleeding and gasping in pain with every breath, the boy was laid out next to me, breathing wetly. His eyes were dull. 
Every once in a while, he sobbed softly. I realized he had nothing. No alien world to draw comfort from, nowhere to go while they hurt him, no wolfman to pick him up and hold him high. So I reached out, hissing with pain as my fingertips probed in the marble. Something was stuck to my palm, soft and crushed and sticky. When I splayed my hand, I saw a single violet leaf, the last one of the bouquet I'd shredded off the limb. I'd scraped it off with my thumbnail and painstakingly pinched it between my fingers. I held it out to the boy. He stared blankly at me for a long time. His breathing was shallow and increasingly slow, eyes losing what little light they had. Then, without warning, he reached across and plucked it from my fingers. I looked past him and saw a familiar figure standing silently in the corner. The wolfman, fixated on the unearthly leaf. The memory ended with the image of the boy's small hand greedily taking the leaf before suguing into another. I was much taller now, several years older. I somehow felt too heavy and curiously empty at the same time. Something heavy covered my head and weighed down my shoulders. A massive, snarling snout protruded from my face, obscuring my vision except for a small, round tunnel. The narrow field of sight was filled by a golden tube, ornately carved with horned animals and inlaid with gemstones. I was dizzy in the dream, unwell and confused, even more so when a spidery pair of hands set a squalling infant before me. I looked across the table, and I saw the blonde woman, watching me with unimaginable pain in her face. Then suddenly, that memory ended too, and I fell back with a sharp gasp. Carpet scraped my palms, and my husband's office door stood in front of me. Four fingers protruded from the crack underneath it, burnt and swollen. As I watched, they retreated, leaving more scraps of ruined flesh behind on the carpet. Who, who was that boy? I realized I was shaking, painful, full-body shudders, almost convulsions. Thomas, she answered. I leaned my head against the door, squeezing my eyes shut. Who are you? Christine. So low, so soft and sad. Who's with you? The girl who looks like me, who is she? My sister. God damn it. Can you open the door? She rattled the knob weakly. Please, Rachel, let us out before the bull comes back for her heart. And sure enough, I heard the thud of that corrupted heart beating away. No longer far away in a castle, no longer buried in a pit, but here, ten feet away, spraying rot all over the two creatures on the other side of the door. Creatures that, if Michael was to be believed, I was responsible for. But could I believe him? Could I actually trust him? I didn't think so, but I also didn't know what else to do. Richard was an unknown quantity. Whatever their disagreement, he and Michael agreed that he was some kind of traitor. Thomas was now a homeless, unstable prostitute who'd hit me rather than speak with me. The women in the room weren't figments of my imagination, nor was that heart. Michael clearly saw it, even going so far as to crush the maggots that crawled out of it. And the pit. The pit in my backyard that led down to a wild ocean under the green sky, the same green sky I'd seen in the arena. He'd shown it to me of his own volition. But where else did Michael fit into this? Was he the wolfman from my memories? He had to be. His eyes were too distinctive and rare. Even though his voice was much, much different, so much softer and younger, he was so familiar, even decades ago. And he'd never answered me when it came to my dead doppelganger or her gentle sister. He'd never told me why he killed her, or even that he had. But you got out before. I saw you. You were in the woods, in the restaurant. You walked with me to th the shop. They converse quietly, Christine's soft whispers mingling with her sister's raspy gurgles. Finally, Christine told me, We've been trapped here since Michael pulled you out of the water. You were in here before he took me there, to the pit in the backyard, the rough mock-up of the arena in the palace. No, we weren't. I squeezed my eyes shut. How did this keep getting worse and worse? Every second it became more horrifying and more absurd. I was in that room with you yesterday. He took me t to the water last night. No. The woman who looked like me rasped harshly. He's trapped us here for weeks. Here, Christine said kindly. She wriggled her ruined hands back under the door. Let me show you. No, said my doppelganger. 
It was hard to tell, but she sounded furious, enraged. It isn't enough. No, but it's important. Rachel, promise you'll remember it, even when you learn everything else. I stared down at her blistered, puffy hands, feeling inexpressibly ill. What do you mean by everything else? Christine curled her finger slightly. A blister puff, pus cascaded over her palm. This first. I swallowed hard and touched my fingertips to hers. A brief moment of darkness followed by light flooding past my half-closed lids. It had an eerie quality, a familiar green-gray tinge. Clammy air enveloped me, heavy and cold and wet. Surf crashed along a nearby shore, not quite loud enough to drown out the sound of a man crying. My body jostled weirdly. I tried to move, tried to open my eyes, but I couldn't. All I could see was a silver sky and overhead. The jostling had a rhythm, which I quickly figured out. Footsteps. Someone was carrying me, and that someone was weeping. After several minutes, the man waded into the sea. Flashes of brilliant light, too bright and rich for my eyes to fully register, flickered at the edges of my vision. My hands and feet were soon submerged. Wet tendrils of hair clung to my face. It itched terribly, and I was so, so cold. It went beyond feeling like I would ever be warm again. I couldn't remember what it meant to be warm in the first place. Water lapped across me, and then quickly covered me. The weeping man brushed wet hair away from my face and leaned over, resting his forehead against mine. His hands trailed down my face and bare shoulders, gently stroking my skin. I felt the pressure from his touch, but nothing else. I tried to speak, but couldn't move my tongue or mouth. When he drew back, I realized it was Michael. I could barely see through the slit in my eyelids. His face was puffy with tears and badly bruised. Half-healed wounds snaked down his throat, disappearing past the collar of his shirt. He caressed my face one last time and retreated, leaving me to drift on the waves. I floated for what seemed a long, long time. Then suddenly, there was something heavy, combined pressure and pull on my chest. I started to sink. I tried to turn my eyes, but they wouldn't move. It was all right, though. As I watched, something rose my chest, filling my vision. The blonde woman, Christine, covered in horrific burns and staring down at me with frantic worry. She slid into the water and started pulling me toward the shore. The water lapped around my face and filled my ears, deafening me to everything but the deep vibrations of the water. After a moment, there came more pressure, heavy and crushing, pushing me under the waves. Water filled my mouth and I choked. I could move again. I immediately flailed, kicking Christine and propelling myself as a second body crawled out of my chest. The tide pulled me away from the shore, carrying me toward the horizon. Michael's frantic screams carried over the water, but already sounded distant. Christine swam after me. I wondered how badly her burns hurt, submerged in the seawater. Then I wondered why I was running away from her, because she had never hurt me. She'd only helped me, up to the end of her life when some part of me had done something unforgivable. My consciousness glanced across the memory, but ricocheted away, unable to dwell on it and unwilling to remember. Far away, Michael continued to scream. Seawater splashed against my face, making it hard to see, but I caught a glimpse as he rushed back into the water, chasing me even as the tide bore me away. Something circled my wrists, soft and hard at the same time. Cold iron coated in bloated flesh. The smell overwhelmed me, sweetly corrupted and thick as mucus. It pulled me under the waves and away from the open sea, drowning me even as it carried me to shore. At least I couldn't smell it underwater. That alone made dying worth it. I was drowning, dying, almost dead, and then I suddenly felt the sea floor, sand scraping my knees and then my arms and my chest and thighs. And finally, I was on the shore, gasping and coughing up geysers of glimmering black water. Michael skidded to his knees and pumped my chest. I choked and coughed and tried to scream, but it hurt too badly. Everything from the guts to mouth felt raw, scorched, every drop of water and every hitch of breath in all-consuming agony. Michael tipped me onto my side as I vomited seawater and viscous, foul slime. Then he pulled me up into a clumsy hug, sobbing into my wet hair as Christine and her dead sister looked on with unreadable faces. Again, it went dark. 
When I opened my eyes, I was back in my hallway, leaning against Michael's office door. Do you see now? Christine asked. We came from the water. Then he brought us back and locked us away. I ran my fingers through my hair, half expecting it to be wet. What about the bull? She was already out. I tried to understand this, but couldn't. Even with all this new information, I didn't know what she meant and didn't want to. Did he... Did he take me there to resurrect me? Yes, Christine said, sounding relieved. After he killed you, my doppelganger added. Everything seemed to stop, including my heart. Don't do this to her, Christine moaned. A second set of fingers wormed beneath the door, bloated and wet. Myriad shades of bruised purple and moldy gleam, but flat, fish belly white. Do you want to see? Michael's face filled my mind's eye, broken and battered as he wept over me. Did I want to see? Did I really want to see? Did it matter? Before I could convince myself otherwise, I reached for the dead hand. Dead flesh squelched under my hand, eliciting a bone-deep shudder. Suddenly, I was in a room, round and white, brightly lit, with the same sterile quality of a doctor's office. I was chained to an unassuming tile floor. A pair of polished boots stood before me, and behind that stood four standard office chairs that looked both surreal and laughable. Every part of me hurt, but the pain felt distant, like it was barely my own. I looked up and saw Michael's face staring down at me, impervious, emotionless. What? He asked silkily. Are you hoping to accomplish? He had a gun in his right hand, a slim, too long pistol I could barely identify. You've been breaking us for a long time. My voice surprised me, as did my eloquence. Shattering us like mirrors and throwing us away into a proverbial bottomless pit. Except every pit has a bottom, and all our pieces are piling up. You're making a mountain, and it's too late to stop. An old man spoke from one of the office chairs. Even in metaphor, a mountain of broken glass is hardly frightening. Especially when buried. It's not buried. It's in a pit that's been becoming too small for it. You've broken too many of us, made a mountain too high to hide, and for the first time, that mountain is going to touch sunlight. Do you know what happens when light touches a mirror? Maybe it was my imagination, but the atmosphere went from one of contemptuous relaxation to unease. Please, you're only broken kittens, said the old man, finally. Your broken kittens are evolving into lions, and you're too stupid to see it. Did you know any of this, Michael? The man asked stiffly. No, he said calmly. Forgive my doubt, dear boy, but how am I to believe you? He didn't know, I interjected. I didn't tell him anything because he's one of you. Michael's impassive expression twisted briefly. I didn't say this to save him. I did it because either way, they were going to let him live. They had to. But if they believed me, they wouldn't change him, which meant he would remember the venom spilling from my mouth until he finally died. I fixed Michael with a miserable stare, trying to fight back tears. He looked back with a broken expression. My throat felt thick. I... I drew a ragged breath. I hate... One deafening shot and incredible pressure. The unsettling sensation of open air prickling my freshly exposed brain. And then darkness. Then I was back in my hallway, curled on my side, hands still entwined in my doppelganger's dead fingers. That happened before, Christine wailed. He brought you back afterward, Rachel. Remember, he brought you back. You're his idol, said my double. She squeezed my hand, perhaps trying to comfort me. But all men turn against their gods. She continued to stroke my hand. Goose flesh rippled across my skin with every stroke, but I couldn't gather the strength to move. Where do I go? I finally asked. What do I do? Find Thomas, said my double, after you let us out. I want to let them out, I really do, but the prospect of facing more, more memories, more revelations, more and more and more about the past I'm increasingly thankful to have forgotten, is paralytic. So is the idea of facing them, of seeing Christine's ruined body in all this burnt, blistered glory, of standing before the wet, glistening rot that wore my face and spoke in a voice like mine. I think I could break down the door if I had to. It's thick and heavy, 
made of solid oak, but I could chip and bang away at it, or at the walls. But Michael has an alarm attached to the door, and even if I got them out, I have no idea how I would travel with these women, these ruined, broken things I somehow brought back from another world. I can't bring them with me, but I can't leave them here. Likewise, I don't think I can stay here, but I have nowhere to go. I still have no idea who I am. I don't know what to do. I sat in the hall for a long while, watching shadows overtake the house as the dead women stroked my hands, but it was hard to ignore the blisters on Christine's fingers and the squelchy rot of my doppelgangers, but I felt it was my duty to let them touch me. Somehow, I knew they drew comfort from me, but it finally grew intolerable, so I pulled away and stood up. My doppelganger instantly started screaming and Christine began to cry. Leaving the hall was almost physically impossible. Each step took monumental effort and the hall seemed to stretch before me, expanding half a step for each one I took. Upon exiting the hall, however, their voices ceased and a weight I hadn't even noticed evaporated. Once upstairs, I felt lighter, safer, and clearer. Without them whispering in my ear, I could make plans. Unfortunately, I had nothing with which to make plans. I had no phone or car, and the city was four hours away on foot. I just about resigned myself to walking when I heard a car pull into the driveway. I rushed to the window, and sure enough, it was Michael. Even from two stories up, his body language telegraphed anger and misery. As I watched, he slammed the car door and stalked to the house. Rachel? Cool and impersonal, painfully sharp. Rachel! I wondered how much he knew, if a security camera had caught me talking to the dead women. Since there was no denying it in any case, I went to the bedroom door. Yes? He came upstairs. Please get ready. We're meeting colleagues. The only hint of emotion in his sentence. For dinner shortly. It was so mundane I wanted to laugh. This was what he was angry about? What? Dinner. He repeated coldly. With colleagues at eight. Get ready. Your colleagues? Last I checked, you have none, so yes, mine. He rummaged through the closet, then pulled out a red dress and tossed it onto the bed. Wear that. I crossed my arms over my chest, trying to make sense of this new, cold persona. I don't want to go. It isn't up for discussion. What the hell do you- He whirled around with such ferocity, I skittered away. His expression was cold and angry, but his eyes were frantic. Despite everything, I was relieved. Whatever was wrong with him had nothing to do with me. Rachel, please get ready. I reached meekly for the dress, looking contrite. He stepped forward and gently circled my wrists with his hands. Calmness overtook me. For the first time in many days, I felt relaxed. This is very important, he said. Just do as I say and follow my lead, as you always do. He took his hands away. I reached for him absently, fingers brushing his chest. He finally smiled and twisted a lock of my hair around his finger. I could have collapsed for relief. Don't worry. We'll have a good time. The assurance buoyed me. I believed him utterly and wanted to keep him happy. Nothing seemed important by comparison. Not the dead woman, not my past, not a mysterious alternate universe or my dire suspicions about my husband. I was happy, I was safe, I was in love, and we were going out to dinner. Deep in my bones, I knew this wasn't right, but every time anxiety gained a foothold, I'd look to Michael for reassurance, and he would smile, and I would feel elation and relief in equal measure. The drive to dinner was uneventful. I didn't feel the need to speak. Why bother? When I felt so happy, so beautifully content, and he was clearly preoccupied. Every once in a while, I'd feel a surge of unease. Whenever that discomfort reared its head, Michael reached for my hand and all was well again. The restaurant was small and intimate, lit with dim golden lamps and candlelight. Vines crawled up the walls, an impeccably dressed woman led us upstairs. As we passed through, several patrons nodded respectfully, some even craned their necks as we passed. Michael and I took our seats at a cozy table. To my surprise, Richard was there, as well as a woman about Michael's age, two middle-aged men who appeared to be twins, and an elderly man with wide, glassy eyes. When Richard saw me, his face broke into a wicked little smile. We meet again. A sense of disquiet reared up, but Michael's hand was suddenly on mine, and buoyant happiness settled over me again. I didn't speak much. There was no point. 
Richard cracked a few jokes and lavished attention on me, which was mildly uncomfortable, but sort of funny to me. Such a young man trying to make a move on me in front of my husband. His boss, no less. The woman and the twins largely ignored Richard and made polite conversation. The old man, however, remained silent as we drank and ate. He stared at Richard most of the evening, but occasionally would glance at me. His eyes were wide, wet, and swollen, as if he'd been crying recently. Overwhelming sympathy flooded me. How terrible that this poor man couldn't enjoy such a wonderful dinner. I deliberately offered encouraging smiles and tried several times to engage him in conversation, but failed. It finally occurred to me that he was probably deaf or mute, maybe both. Annoyingly, Richard interrupted me whenever I tried to speak with the old man. He constantly reached for my hands and leaned across the table in a manner that was far too intimate, and thus incredibly troubling. I wanted to address it, wanted to chastise him, but whenever the words rose to my lips, I felt Michael's fingers tracing gentle circles in my palm. Conversation progressed. I paid no attention. I felt too sorry for the old man. He looked vaguely familiar, but I simply couldn't place him. His behavior confused and saddened me. His eyes kept widening and flicking between Richard and I. Finally, I realized Richard was saying my name, and apparently had been for a long while. Rachel. He repeated, Rachel. I frowned, then smiled quizzically. I'm sorry, I missed that. I want to show you the view from the top. They have a balcony here, and the view is truly phenomenal. He looked quite beautiful in the dim light, almost angelic, but I didn't want to go with him. I wanted to stay with Michael and the sad old man. I looked at my husband, intending to voice my reluctance, but he squeezed my hand and gently said, Go on, it's lovely. I didn't like it, but that was that. I stood up. Richard led me to a flight of stairs. Unable to help myself, I glanced back over my shoulder. Michael was staring after us, fixated and unreadable. I gave him a nervous smile that he didn't return. Richard took us up the stairs and down a hall, past the doors in several conference rooms. Cold air washed over me the moment we exited onto the roof. I looked out eagerly, expecting a stunning view, but was disappointed. There was nothing remarkable about it. Richard casually twisted his fingers into mine and pulled me to the edge with a wide, assured smile. The moment our hands touched, my head exploded into a pounding, crippling pain that literally doubled me over. I was vaguely aware that Richard had dropped to his haunches and put his arms around me, but that made it worse. Whenever he touched me, a jagged bolt of pain ripped through my skull. I'm sorry, I whispered. Give me just, just a second. The moment I pulled away, pain abated. I beelined for the door. At the threshold, I looked back at Richard, who was white-faced and clearly furious. Disconcerted but not yet angry, I hurried inside. Warmth and dim golden light welcomed me. Excitement and anticipation returned. I'd be back with Michael soon, any moment now. And then, suddenly one of the conference room doors opened and a withered hand reached out. I took it reflexively and in response, it tugged insistently. Without a thought, I obeyed and entered the room. It was the old man. His large, wet eyes looked impossibly bright in the light streaming through the window. Sympathy flooded me again. I wanted nothing more than to punish whoever had hurt him. He tried to speak, but tremors shook him, breaking up his words before they left his mouth. Finally, he said, Rachel. The door opened. I turned guiltily, expecting Richard, but it was Michael. My face broke into a wide smile, and he reciprocated this time. What are you two doing in here? He asked gently. I think the gentleman here got lost, I confessed. Let's all go back together, then. Micah returned us to the table. Giddy contentment subsumed me again. The rest of the meal passed in a happy, golden blur. The only sour note was Richard. He watched me hungrily, the entire time with an expression I hated. I ignored him, instead lavishing attention on Michael and the old man. Toward the end, the old man smiled and reached for my hand. I took his eagerly, his fingers instantly twisted. I tried to let go, but he squeezed back insistently. His fingers wriggled again, then clumsily deposited a slip of paper into my palm. Michael suddenly spoke. Richard, can you come with me for a moment? I have paperwork for you. I don't know that it'll wait till Monday. Richard gave me one more burning look, then exited with Michael. The old man tapped my hand urgently. Of course, I remembered the paper. I gave him a genial smile, then opened my palm. 
It was a note that said, I'm sorry, I will forget, but please help me again. Below was a phone number alongside the words, Call for John. It was sad, but so sweet. He must have dementia. Even so, looking at the note caused an odd, urgent twinge, a compulsion. I excused myself and went to the restroom, where I promptly slid the note into my bra. On my way back, Richard sidled up beside me, and before I could stop him, gently pressed me back against the wall. We're going to see each other soon, he said. Permanently, I hope. He swept a sheaf of hair away from my face, studying me intently. We're almost done. He, his touch, his hungry, shameless eyes, his terrible behavior, finally broke my reverie. I ducked away, breathlessly angry, and opened my mouth to yell. But then there were hands on my shoulder, strong and familiar, and a sense of calm washed over me again. Are you alright? Michael asked quietly. I want to go, I said. Then we will. Michael excused us graciously, with smiles and handshakes and apologies all around, including to the old man. Even in my strange, dreamy state, the terror on the old man's face made me incredibly sad. Only when we were on our way home did the utter bizarreness of the evening hit me. What was wrong with Richard? Michael absently reached for my hand. No, I withdrew. Don't do that. Why was he acting that way? Against my will, I felt my mood leveling, felt that deceptive happiness overtake me. Shh, Michael soothed. Don't worry, it's all right. If it comes up again, just give him what he wants. Thomas's face, imperious and impersonally contemptuous, flitted through my mind. He'd said that too, those exact words, but about Michael. It took all my strength to hold on to that profound anxiety, to not let the quiet euphoria draw it away. I kept thinking of the old man's note and the phone number. As we crawled through the crowded streets, I caught a glimpse of a payphone, right in front of a gas station, like all good American payphones. Michael, I said, can you pull over? I need a restroom. He shrugged helplessly. Do you see anywhere to pull over? Okay, I opened the door. Don't worry, I'll be right back. I dashed down the street, drawing a few stairs. Michael shouted after me. I intentionally ran in the opposite direction, then cut across an alley and came up behind the gas station. I peered around the side. Michael's car was nowhere to be seen. He'd clearly been forced along with traffic. I darted to the payphone, dug the slip of paper out of my dress, and dialed collect. I held my breath. On the seventh ring, someone answered. Who are you? Doesn't matter. I'm calling for John. Low, slick laughter. <laughs> You sure? He's hard to catch, and not all that talented anymore. We've got better. I'm positive. The usual or the special? Both, I said nonsensically. That's dangerous. I'll be fine. Suit yourself. Where do we pick you up? I glanced around frantically. Still no sign of Michael, but if he'd gone around the block, I had seconds left. How about you drop him off? Really? Yes. I gave them directions to the corner by our house. Rocks and a copse of trees were set back from the road there, offering some privacy. That's an unorthodox location. I want him there tomorrow. When? Oh god, what if Michael didn't go into work tomorrow? 1 p.m. How long? An hour. You're brave. It'll be 500. We'll wait for five minutes. If you aren't there, we're leaving. No exceptions. Michael's car nosed around the corner. Got it. Bye. I hung up and dashed to the gas station, pushing past a line of irritable people to get into the bathroom, where I crumpled the paper and flushed it down the toilet. Then I washed up, blotting the sweat off my face, and exited. Michael was waiting by the door. He grabbed me by the wrist and dragged me out. What are you doing? He demanded. You ran into traffic. How stupid can you be? I tried to answer, but it all overwhelmed me. Fear, confusion, revulsion, anxiety, and I burst into tears. Seized with a stroke of inspiration, I said, It's Richard. I I didn't. I couldn't. It felt wrong, and you just told me to, to give him what he- Michael's face softened, and he drew me close. That isn't what I meant. I'm sorry. It, it was a poor choice of words. He kissed my forehead. Let's go home. We got home and went to bed, but I didn't sleep. In the morning, he went to work. I pulled the remaining cash from my computer bag and sat down to wait. At quarter past twelve, I walked to the rendezvous point. I arrived early, so I went to sit on the boulders in the trees and waited while the wind rattled the leaves and kicked up dust. A few minutes later, a nondescript car pulled onto the median. I stood and went to meet it. The back door opened and Thomas tumbled out, blinking in the bright light. He had a dreamy smile that evaporated when he saw me. 
He tried to climb back inside, but the driver got out, grabbed him, and dragged him to me. Thomas watched me with wide, hopeless eyes as I handed the driver his money. I pointed through the trees. Take him there. Thomas heaved a sob as he was marched over. I followed behind, feeling inexpressibly guilty. One hour, they told me, and left. Thomas watched them go, trembling and clearly aching to run after them. Once they were no longer in sight, I held my arms out in a conciliatory gesture. Thomas reared back, tears flooding his eyes. Calm down. I don't want to hurt you. It's Rachel. I know you remember me. I'm Rachel. He shook his head. A weird, creepy smile spread over his face. They killed Rachel. You're what's left. You're Gabrielle. I'm definitely Rachel. They killed me, then Michael took me to the sea. Thomas finally stilled. Do you know what that means? He brought you back, he said slowly. I shrugged nervously. I guess. I don't remember much of anything, Thomas. He nodded. That's the sea. Yes, that's what happens. His face twisted and tears spilled down his face. That's why you forgot to save me. He turned to look at me. His face was thin and haggard, fine bone structure nearly obliterated by pain and abuse and endless sun. But his eyes were the same, bright golden caramel, arresting as the day I first met him. You forgot me, forgot your promise, forgot you loved me. He dissolved into sobs. I fought a lump in my throat and leaned down, intending to hug him, but he shoved me away. I knew you would, he said. You had the hierarchy on your side. You were the strong one, so you belong to the bull, which makes you safe. You cross the sea whenever you want to. I only cross when I'm hurting, so they hurt me. They hurt me and all the rest of us and used our pain to give sacrifice to open up the other worlds. But it was okay. I hated you sometimes because I'm weak. Because you promised to be there, and you were. You were. You were. His face darkened and clouded, hatred mingling with the suffering. Until him, the Bluebeard. Why do you call him that? I asked sharply, but he'd already devolved into another rant. It's because of him. You didn't know any better. It's okay, I understand. You couldn't help it, but it's his fault. He broke you down. He made Gabrielle, made you into the bull. He hates me. He made you believe what he wants you to believe. Made you see what he wants you to see because all the world's a stage. Shivers rolled down my spine, convulsive and almost painful. Why do you call him that? Why are you calling him a Bluebeard? Thomas looked at me strangely. Not Bluebeard, Rachel. Bluebird. He's a Bluebird. They control our minds. Don't you remember? He looked away, distant and dreamy and so obviously frightened. Did you protect Richard? What about Richard? His face contorted into a rictus of panic defeat. Oh no. He moaned. Oh no. Thomas, look at me. Just look at me. What about Richard? Don't ask about him anymore. This is all his fault. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have one more question though, and then you can go back. He kept shaking his head. Did you report me as missing? Yes, I was worried. You were gone, and so was the baby. He looked up at me, golden eyes swollen and shimmering with tears. What happened to the baby? What baby? His earnest hope dissipated before my eyes, leaving brokenness in its wake. Panic surged through me. Thomas, what baby? He began to wail. The driver ran over, breaking through the trees, and gave me a terrible look. Half like I was a slug, half like I was a god. They shuffled over and set their hands on Thomas's heaving shoulders. I'm sorry, ma'am. He's just not up for you anymore. Can't keep up. We'd have told you if we'd known it was you. Here. They fished through their pockets and pulled out $200 bills. Partial refund. I recoiled. No, just give it to him. Thomas shook his head. We all make sacrifices, Rachel. Remember, we all make sacrifices. Wait, Thomas. I took the bill and scribbled my address on it. Here, if you ever need anything. He swatted the bill away and started screaming as the driver chuckled to themselves. No, no, I know where they took you. They aren't taking me too. You can't make me. You can't fucking make me. The driver wrapped both arms around Thomas's narrow chest and hauled him away. I stood numbly. The door slammed, cutting off Thomas's shrieks, and the car started to rumble away. After a while, I walked home. When I got inside, a calm, silky voice said, Visiting prostitutes now, are we? I screamed and whirled around. Michael sat on the sofa, waiting for me. I grabbed the doorknob, but he said, Don't leave. I won't. 
I whispered. Michael regarded me for a long while, almost impossibly still. He isn't the man you remember. Nothing is what I remember. He watched me carefully, eyes glittering strangely. They looked green this afternoon, perfectly green, no trace of blue in either eye. How did you know? How did I know what? Rage reared up, but it was swiftly overtaken by hopeless guilt, that I went to see him. I know everything, Rachel. How? He didn't respond right away. The longer he stared, the weaker I felt, physically and emotionally, and tired. So, so tired. My knees were rubbery, the muscles in my thighs incredibly sore. The couch looked soft and inviting, but he was sitting on it. Still, if I sat, I'd be able to rest, to gather my thoughts. But he's there. I needed to stay away, needed to keep my distance. I was tired, though. So, so catastrophically tired. I shuffled to the sofa and settled down beside him. My head dropped back, sinking into the cushions. It was as soft as I'd imagined, incredibly comfortable and relaxing, and then it wasn't. I blinked, then shot up and scurried to the other end of the room. I must have crossed some invisible threshold because the dead women suddenly started moaning from the office. Get away from there. Michael beckoned tiredly. They wake up when you get too close. I don't give a shit about them. What did you do to me? Is that... That's what you did to me when Richard was... My voice caught in my throat. I felt like I was being strangled. What are you? Emotion flickered across his otherwise inscrutable expression, too quickly for me to identify. I'm a bluebird. I waited, afraid to speak. If I said the wrong thing, surely he'd cloud my mind up again. So I waited, even though it was hard. The flatness in his face frightened me along with the preternatural shine in his eyes. It was too much, and I finally gave in. What does that mean? It means I can influence your thoughts and actions. God help me. I laughed. He watched patiently, with the lazy, relaxed concentration of a cat. When I finished, he said, I can make you see things that aren't there, and not see things that are. And I can make you hurt, or I can make you happy. If necessary, and with a great deal of effort, I can make you move even if you resist. That's why we are paired. I set the stage and you perform. The voices of Thomas and my doppelganger are merged. All the world's a stage, you only see what he wants you to see. For who? I leaned back, settling against the cushions. You don't want to know. Bullshit! No, he said evenly. Rachel. I see and sense every part of you. Right now, at this time, I know for a fact that you do not actually want to know this answer." He rubbed his mouth absently. The small indication of anxiety made me feel a little calmer. How did you know I saw Thomas? You knew before I came in. He drummed his fingers along the back of the sofa. If I focus, and if you are open, I can see where you are. Get an idea of what you are doing and who you are with. Now listen like I had a choice. I can influence you, sometimes to the point of absolute control. I can see you, I can sense your feelings, but I cannot hear you. That flicker of emotion again, relief with, what, triumph? Do you understand? I nodded, even though I didn't. He leaned back. What did Thomas tell you? You want me to just give you the only information you don't know? No, I want to help you. But you are making it extremely difficult and you are approaching the end of the line with people who matter. What did Thomas tell you? Whatever it means that I'm consecrated to the bull. Your body, not you. We made sure of that. What's the difference? He was impassive again, a bright-eyed sphinx in the waning light. You were taken as a child and subjected to all manner of horrors. This was intentional. It was meant to break you apart. It worked. Like many broken victims, you compartmentalized, to the point you effectively became two distinct people. My head swam. A uh, split personality? Dissociation to preserve your well-being and what I guess you'd call your spirit. It ensured that you remained yourself. The other... The hesitation in his voice, the utter hateful darkness made my heart seize. Images of a golden bull swept my mind's eye. It was a joint creation between you and our owners. His eyes finally dimmed. And me. 
I don't understand. When children are broken, they have four potential pathways. You were marked for the worst of these. That golden palace, that filthy arena filled with children, a young boy surrounded by naked men, weeping as a horn shadow blotted the lights. But you, not your other, defied expectations and made it very clear, very quickly, that you are something else. Yes, something else. Portals and violet leaves, hallucinatory skies and black oceans churning with incomprehensible gods. This quality saved your life. Other discoveries followed, each one making you more and more valuable, until it was obvious you were an important asset in their arsenal. Why am I important? The water in that place, in the sea. It heals everything. Only you can carry it out. I try, but it evaporates the moment I return. I thought of the arena, of poor Thomas plucking that feathery violet leaf from my fingers. They didn't know that then, though. No, at first they kept you simply because you were amusingly mercenary. And then curiously hardy. They expected you to die. I expected you to die. Do you know why you're alive? Do you remember? The leaf, I answered. It saved Thomas too, didn't it? Numbness settled over me like a suffocating blanket. I wondered if the numbness was mine or Michael's. Maybe in his way, he was trying to protect me. It healed us after, after what they did. He nodded. No one knew why you were alive. You two were the first to last until, Ugh. He shuddered involuntarily, another sign of weakness, real or manufactured to garner my sympathy. Cetacean. What were they doing to us? The words were so blunt, it was almost comical. It was a ritual sacrifice. They put all of you in a pit until one of you kills the rest. Usually the solution only occurs to a single child, sometimes to none at all, but you and Thomas came to the same conclusion. No, I thought. Thomas only came to the conclusion after watching me. I know. Michael said, startling me badly. But I could see you were attached to him. So I lied for you. Then what happened, after we survived? You compartmentalized even further, funneling every part, every feeling, every impulse, every memory of the creature they created into a separate entity, an other. Had I been myself, I'd have stopped you, but I wasn't myself any more than you were. Goose flesh rippled across my flesh, feeling like bugs, worms burrowing through my skin into my heart. Why would you have been able to stop that process? Because I trained you. Or rather, my other trained your other. Rage and terror descended on me. Images, memories threatened to surface. Horrifying things that I'd forgotten for a reason. That the sea had drawn out because they were living wounds. It's far worse, Michael said, than what you were thinking. Try not to remember. He slid off the sofa and approached. I backed away immediately. There's no point in remembering. Those people wear our bodies, but they aren't us. We hid them, separated our true selves from them for a reason. Unbidden, I thought of my doppelganger, rotten yet alive, burning with fury and helpless, hopeless hate. He's one of you, she said. I hate you. Michael reared back as if burned. All composure broke, leaving him trembling and teary-eyed. Fresh bruises I hadn't noticed snaked up from his collar. With a miserable burst of clarity, I realized his composure hadn't broken. He didn't have any composure at all. He'd been manipulating my senses, making me perceive an assured serenity that didn't exist. In spite of everything, that broke my heart. I took you to the sea as soon as I could. His voice trembled. They wouldn't let me take you immediately, but they thought the bull would… would… His shoulders heaved, and he drew a deep breath. I convinced them otherwise. I don't know how, I think they were simply desperate, for centuries they've been doing what it is they do, and in a matter of years, your ways did more for them than millennia of their old ways, so I got my way and I brought you back." He reached for me. I wanted to give in, wanted to hold him and be held, but I had another question. Thomas said he reported me missing, he asked about my baby. They took the child before you… before I… He broke off, blinking tears away. Nausea rolled over me like a tide, along with the dangerous, suffocating fuzziness. Before you killed me, I sifted through my memories for any hint of an infant, but found nothing. 
What happened to it? They took it. He repeated. And then? I don't know. How can you not know? I don't... (laughs) He broke off. It's the way it is, Rachel. It wasn't even our first. I thought back to the paperwork, the records that became blank paper the moment Michael touched me. Strange serrations filled the air, increasingly frantic. Whispers, and they were, I finally realized, coming from me. No, 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 no. We we have to go to the police. Michael, we have to. The police? How did that turn out for you last time? The sergeant's laughing face flickered through my mind. Forget the police. The sheriff. The... The state? The goddamn feds? Fucking Interpol! What do you think we're dealing with, Rachel? Do you really believe this kind of corruption starts at the lowest level? It starts high. High with people who can pay for complicity and silence. The higher you go, the worse it gets. You lost this battle thousands of years before you were born. Shut up! I screamed. Everyone, everywhere, is not corrupt! You're right, he said. I was so shocked, I looked up. Then what's stopping you? What's stopping us? He gave me a dark, almost smug look. There are repercussions for spewing what will sound like utter nonsense to a society specifically conditioned to disbelieve anything that isn't mundane. You'll be branded a lunatic, a pariah, a fool. Then you'll be killed, or you'll be broken down into nothing and left to rot like Thomas. He suddenly surged forward. I retreated again, smacked him into the wall as he smashed both hands down on either side of my head. But it gets even better. Even if someone believes you, even if you bring incontrovertible proof at the exact right time to the exact right people, they have one last defense, Rachel. One last ace in the goddamn hole. I can't wait for you to remember anymore. I don't actually believe you'll allow yourself to remember, which is why we have those He pointed toward the hallway, to the office where the dead woman lay. Squalling every time you pass. If they don't jog your memory, nothing will. So it's time. He pushed himself off the wall and disappeared into his office. Outside, the sun fell beyond the canyon. Shadows lengthened and the room abruptly darkened. Michael emerged, carrying an unmarked jewel case. Sit. He put the disc in it to play and left me alone to watch it. It started with darkness. Flame flickered into being, a candle, then ten, then a hundred, lighting in a spiraled away, seeming to float on a sea of darkness. It was beautiful, mesmerizing. Then part of the floor burst into flame, a ring around a familiar pit. The fire illuminated dozens of people in robes and animal masks, arranged into a shape that looked deliberate yet insane. I couldn't look at it for long. Another sorceration, a cloud of whispers that turned into chanting. The firelight suddenly flared, reflecting off a massive figure at the back, a golden bull's head, horns tangled with strands of gemstones, standing before an altar. A pillar stood in front of it, topped with a bright torch. A woman approached from the opposite direction, shunting a small body ahead of her, a child, staggering sleepily through the chanting ranks. The bull moved forward, the body was a woman's naked except for the headdress and the filmy strands of red cloth drifting from her hips. The child continued his trek, wordless and calm. I saw tears on his face and thought of Michael, but not for long. The child stopped at the altar, the bull inclined her head, a mockery of a bow, then removed the headdress and set it reverently on the pillar. The torch filled the bull's mouth and eyes with flames, imbuing the thing with a hideous parody of life. The woman bowed for real this time, then turned and exposed her face. It was me. There's no point in describing what came next. I clapped my hands over my mouth, stifling screams. I felt hands on my shoulder. Don't look. Christine whispered. She stroked my hair. Her fingers were clean and whole, unmarred by burns or blisters. It isn't you. It may not be me, but it is a part of me. I created it. Michael told me as much. I simply excised the rot in my heart and locked it away in a box. It's separate from what I like to think of as me. But it's still me. By the time the video cut to black, I was prostrate on the floor. I lay there for what felt like a long time, aching and trying to make a plan. Finally, Michael came back. When he removed the disc from the player, I stood up unsteadily. Can I see it? I asked. Why? Just, I don't know. My voice broke. He gave me an unreadable look, then held it out. When my fingers touched it, I shuddered. Michael turned away, pretending to study the wall. 
I retreated slowly, trying to mime purposelessness, by winding a meandering path toward the door. Then I opened it and bolted out into the night. Crickets sang, a gentle breeze rustled the leaves overhead. It was cooler than I expected, verging on uncomfortable. But it felt profoundly pure, in the way only crisp, cool air can. I decided to take the video to the police. Who cared if I went to prison? I needed to. Hell, I needed to die. And before that happened, I would make all of this stop forever. I'd barely made it to the road when I juddered to a full, involuntary halt. Michael approached, gravel grinding under his feet, until he was literally breathing down my neck. I closed my eyes, expecting and hoping for the worst. But he only snatched the disc from my hand. Then he turned and went back into the house, slamming the door behind him. I sat down and wept for hours, long after the moon had risen and my tears turned the ground to mud. Then I stood up, wincing as my bones creaked and sore muscles flexed, and went into my husband's house. I'm not done, but I have to make Michael think I am. I did it before, I think that's why they killed me in the first place, and I'll do it again. I'm going to save Thomas, too, and I'm going to find him and take him to the sea. And I guess we'll go from there. Hello everyone. We are finally finished with this super long series, this tie-in to the Phantom Social Worker series. Or, I guess, the Social Worker series is more of a tie-in to this, considering this series actually came out first. So it's not exactly a prequel, although, as far as my channel is concerned, it is a prequel since I did the Phantom Social Worker series first. I want to come in here and explain the ending. If you're not sure what just happened, I can shed some light on it for you because I have a pretty good understanding of how this just ended, and I can confidently say that if you have listened to the full Phantom Social Worker series and this series, you should have all the answers you basically are looking for. If not, if you just listened to this and you haven't heard the Phantom Social Worker one, I would suggest going to listen to that immediately after finishing this, and just keeping in mind that this is definitely something that happened quite a few years before the Phantom Social Worker series and see what you can come up with yourself or you can just listen to me spouting off what I have gathered here in this little blurb that I'm putting at the end. My book club of sorts, I believe. This is basically becoming a book club when I come here at the end and explain things or add to it. So if you are subscribed to me, and you come back to listen to my videos, consider yourself part of this nice little book club we have. On a more serious note, I'd like to very quickly address the content warning in the title. If you're here at the end of the video listening to this aside, and you did skip the part that I put in the description that is the content warning timestamps, you didn't miss very integral parts of the story. If you listen to this aside in the summary, you'll get all the other missing parts that you need so don't worry about that. I just put that in the beginning because I was worried that if there's anyone particularly sensitive to child abuse, not just the kind where a children's getting beaten because there are other parts of this series where children have beaten each other and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, but, you know, other kinds of child abuse, which I'm not going to go in depth about. You should be able to gather that on your own since obviously it's different from the kind that was in the story before. The other part that I'd like to speak about, which I don't think is a big deal, but might be to some people, depending on how you look at it, is that this story does talk about the characters possibly having dissociative identity disorder. I don't think that's a big deal in this story, particularly because the story isn't centered around it, it's not using it as a crutch, and it sounds more to me like it's a supernatural type of identity disorder. Not that these children have the actual real-life disorder, which is a real thing, if you don't know, by chance. It's more so that they have different actual beings living inside of them. So I hope that no one gets particularly upset about that being in the story, but if you are, and you have an argument as to otherwise, uh, please let me know. Because obviously, I don't have the disorder, so I can't speak for people that do. 
If you stumble across this series and you do have it, I would be very interested to hear what you think. Please let me know. So I want to start here with saying what happened at the end. To do that, let me first make sure that it's abundantly clear the characters we have here. So if you listen to the Phantom Social Worker series, Rachel, the main character of this series, is the crazy lady from the very last part of the Social Worker series that did the main character's makeup and then like took her to that weird cult sacrifice that was happening and she put on the bull costume and then sacrificed a child on the altar in front of all those people. That's who Rachel is. Already red flags going up because she was wearing that bull costume and here in this series, she's haunted by that bull character, but we'll get to that in a minute. Michael, obviously, Michael Alder, the bad guy. Well, you know, actually kind of all these people are bad guys from the Phantom Social Worker series, but Michael being one of the big bads from the Phantom Social Worker series is Rachel's husband, we've come to learn. Uh, they didn't seem so lovey-dovey in the Phantom Social Worker series and now it's obvious why. They obviously have a bit of a falling out here, and it seems like they don't come to grips with whatever happened, you know, they they stay fallen out. Richard is the main character from the Social Worker series' brother. Because if you'll remember, Richard is the name that he was given after he was taken as a child. And it's become pretty clear that when he was taken as a child, pretty much the same thing happened to him as happened to Rachel. So we're kind of getting a central theme here that the cult or organization that Rachel is a part of that she doesn't really remember takes children that have certain abilities or things they seem to be able to see or do and they're put in an arena to fight to the death and then the ones that win are made into like these weird agents or parts of the cult and then the other ones are cannibalized and eaten. Finally, you know, the other main character, Christine, she, as far as I know, doesn't recur in the Phantom Social Worker series, but she's kind of more or less a ghost that haunts Rachel, kind of like a psychosis type of thing going on, but I'm not quite sure because Michael says he sees them too, he acknowledges that they're physical beings, but she also seems to kind of haunt Rachel around but it's also made kind of abundantly clear that a lot of that could have been Michael just screwing around with Rachel's head for some reason. So now that I've addressed the characters, in case you didn't make any of those connections, the ending. This ending basically is Rachel saying that she's gonna do everything she can to take all this evidence to the police because she's lost her memory and she sees that she was, you know, sacrificing children and was like a horrible part of the cult. But obviously, that never happens because in the Phantom Social Worker series, we see that she's in like that giant mansion that the main character is brought to, and she is still being forced to do work on behalf of the cult. And she's sacrificing children. So that the series ends, and then when it's picked back up in the Phantom Social Worker series, at the very end of that series, it's extremely sad because Rachel does not have a happy ending. Her ending is that she has to keep working for these horrible people. There is so much to this story. I mean, the ending is a little more complex than that, but that's bare bones what the story ends as. And there's so, so much that happens. Far too much for me to cover. The story was very long, but I will do a tiny synopsis at the end and go over a couple of the main points I have written down. But I also want to talk about a couple of things that aren't related to the storyline just because the series was so long and if you're interested in hearing about things like this then I'm you know I'm just gonna talk about it a little bit I also want to address some things I saw in the comments that I really agreed with or disagreed with you know of the other parts and kind of talk about what it was like to narrate this series first of all it was extremely long <laughs> it was a lot of work but I still did really like this series. Some of the things I did like, you know, the concept is pretty cool, like cults and things like that I find really interesting. And one of the main things I like about the story, even though this can this can be seen as a good or bad thing, is that we never really know more at any given moment than the main character does. We aren't given any background or anything that the main character doesn't herself know, and she's lost her memory, so she's not even, you know, a good source. So, you can look at that in a good or a bad way. 
in a way, it's, you know, good because we kind of get to experience the story as she does, but it's also bad. And a lot of people in the comments, you know, we're talking about that, and I definitely see how that can be bad. Because we don't know what the heck's going on half the time, but neither does she, so that could be good or bad. It kind of depends on what kind of story you like. Uh, so I like the concept. The characters were pretty good. I really like Michael Alder. I think he's a good bad guy in the Phantom Social Worker series, and I think he is a good character in this series because I really ended up feeling for him. Thomas, he is tragic. Um, <laughs> I felt really sad for him. He obviously tried to do what the same thing Rachel tried to do, but instead ended up going insane. And even though he tried to get away, he didn't. And now he has to work as a prostitute and he's not happy. Thomas also, this is a small detail if you'll remember, is brought up in the end of the Social Worker series uh, when Rachel's in that room crying and she says, where's Thomas? And Michael says, on the beach where you left him. So that brings me to think Rachel at some point probably did end up being able to take Thomas to that weird other world and take him to the beach for whatever reason and he got left there. So Thomas didn't get a happy end either. And finally, Richard. Um, the Richard in this story for me felt super disconnected from the Richard in the Phantom Social Worker series, you know, cause he's the little brother of the main character from that series, but that's okay, because this is a prequel to that one, so it's it's okay they don't really connect, obviously, because he didn't really awaken to his memories until that series anyway. Some of the things I didn't like, the series was long as heck, a uh, super slow burn getting to where we are at now. I think that like two parts of the series could have been taken out, because this series is seven parts long, and I just put several parts together to, to kind of make it go on a little faster because I didn't want to have seven parts of this up on my channel because it's already quite long. The only other thing I can really say I generally didn't like about the series is that there wasn't a, a ton of sound design for me to do in like the first three parts, which I mean, it's good that there wasn't more work, I guess, but it was also just kind of boring because a lot of it is just like standing around talking, standing around trying to figure out why I don't have my memory. But, I don't know. That just kind of happens with stories sometimes. So now, I'm going to say a small synopsis of the story. I've made a couple of notes and I'm just gonna really briefly overview what happened in the whole story, not just this last part. So if you're interested in that, stick around and maybe I can kind of connect some lines for you if you haven't connected them yourself already. So at the beginning of this story, Rachel wakes up in a weird brainwashing facility with no memory. Christine, the dead woman in the closet, approaches her out of the woods, and this also was never addressed, by the way. It's never addressed how she got there, why she's there, whether or not she was a figment of her imagination, or if Michael was screwing with her, but that's alright, I guess. Richard is also there with no memory, which isn't explained, but I believe that's probably because whatever Rachel did to get her memory wiped, Richard either helped or did as well, so I think they're both there because they did something bad and the higher-ups didn't like that. Because it is mentioned that Richard is on another chance. So he's obviously done something bad in the past. We figure out Michael Alders, Rachel's husband. He comes and snatches her up and takes her home. And then we start to learn more about Rachel's past. Growing up as a child, she was victim to a cult. A cult that takes children, makes them fight to the death, eats the ones that don't win and takes the one that do win and do something with them that we aren't exactly sure what. We can probably assume that Rachel, uh, Richard, and Michael all had to go through the same process and they get otherworldly abilities from it or they have them already and because they win, they are nurtured by the cult instead of killed. Rachel seems to have the ability to go to this other world and heal people. Michael seems to have the ability to somewhat live forever because it's said several times that he doesn't look nearly his age and he's like over 70 years old according to some of pictures from like 1912. Richard we're unsure of. In the Social Worker series, it's made to look that he's kind of a leader. He's like head of the cult experience we see at the end of the Social Worker series, so I'm not sure what his position is. I'm not sure if we'll ever get an answer to that. 
We never do find out exactly who Rachel is. It's just said she was plucked up out of like an orphanage or ran away from home or something and was put into this cult. We then see at some point this weird other world that Rachel's put into, which seems more like a fever dream, but it's shown later that that is like a physical plane, perhaps another dimension or something like that, but it is a physical world. Michael has killed her in the past and she has been shown to be able to be brought back to life by being brought to this world and put in the ocean there. And it's also shown at the very end of the story that Michael is brainwashing Rachel because another one of his powers is that he can make her think or do whatever he wants basically if he tries hard enough. And so all of the weirdness throughout the story where we're wondering, why is this girl going along with this? Why doesn't she think this is weird? Why is this happening and she's doing nothing? Was all because of Michael. That is an extreme simplification of this story. It's kind of the best I can do without making a video all for just talking about this story. But I mean, I like the story. I think that it was pretty good. I don't know if we'll ever get more information than we've been given already. This story itself is pretty old. It was the very first series that uh, Dopabine or, you know, R.C. Bowman is her other writing name. It's the first story she ever put out on No Sleep. So I'm not sure if we're gonna get a follow-up to this, but if you listen to both series, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on. And it's just basically cults and people being bad people. I thought the story was pretty good. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know if you like this little aside thing that I do at the end of some of these longer stories or stories that I think need a little more explaining. I like doing it, especially for stories like this where a ton of the stuff is ambiguous. But other than that, I hope that you enjoyed the series.